This video has been sponsored by Audible. Audible has the world's largest selection of audiobooks and audio entertainment, including Audible Originals. Audible Originals are stories created exclusively for audio, including documentaries, exclusive audiobooks, and scripted shows that you can't hear anywhere else. Audible keeps you informed, inspired, and entertained. You'll finish more stories when you listen with Audible, and always be part of the conversation. With the convenient Audible app, you can listen anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Mobile, Alexa-enabled, Bluetooth, and more. Listen at the gym, while shopping, in the car, while traveling, anytime you can't read, you can listen with Audible. Audible members get more than ever before. Every month you can choose one audiobook regardless of its price, as well as two Audible Originals from a fresh selection. Members stay motivated and inspired with unlimited access to exclusive guided fitness and meditation programs. Sign up for free updates from the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Post delivered daily to the app. Audible members can easily exchange any title they don't love at any time. Members keep their library of listens forever, even if they cancel. I personally recommend Jaws by Peter Benchley. If you thought the movie was scary, you're in for a surprise. Trust me. Start a 30-day trial and choose one audiobook and two Audible Originals completely free. Just go to audible.com forward slash being scared or just text being scared to 500-500. Again, it's audible.com forward slash being scared or just text being scared to 500-500. When I was 10 years old, my mom started dating this guy named Gary. My dad was an alcoholic and was abusive, so honestly, I always liked Gary from the beginning and I thought that he was a huge step up from my dad. He would come over occasionally, help my mom cook dinner, play video games with me, and the usual cool father figure stuff. It never once occurred to me that there might be something wrong with Gary. Until the night I woke up and saw him standing in the darkness in my bedroom, staring at me. My first thought was that he needed to talk to me or something. But I quickly realized his intentions were not okay. His facial expression was not one I had seen before. Even after I had woken up, he continued to stare at me. Me being awake and noticing him did not faze him in the slightest. His face. Oh God, his face. He was looking at me like I had killed his whole family. Like at any minute, he would strangle me to death. I was shivering with fear, and a few minutes passed before he just casually walked out of my room. The next morning he acted like nothing at all had happened. The first chance I got, I told my mom, and she believed me, thank God. I never saw him again. I have thought about his face in the darkness for years now, as I lay in bed at night. What the hell was he doing? Did he want to kill me? I'll never know the answer. One summer, my parents had booked a cabin for us for a whole week. I can't remember exactly how old I was. I'm guessing around 12. Me, my big sister, and my little brother had been playing and exploring outside all day. 
We were tired, so when our parents asked if we wanted to go to the grocery store with them, me and my sister said no. My little brother wanted to go, and he was too young to be under our supervision anyway, even if he had wanted to stay. They said that they would be back soon, and that they trusted us enough to leave us back at the cabin, as long as we promised to stay inside and stay away from the lake. Both of my parents were always very strict about not letting us swim unauthorized. A couple of moments passed with me and my sister chatting until she decided to take a nap on the couch. I had been drinking juice all evening, so I needed to head to the toilet. The toilet was a separate building near the main cabin, closer to the lake. It was about 8 o'clock, and the evening had already started to darken, since it was almost October. I have always loved scary stories, and I enjoyed the misty nightfall. I was halfway to the toilet, when suddenly, I heard a loud crack in the woods. The sound came from right in front of me, behind the toilet. I froze, and stood quiet for a minute. I saw nothing. I thought that it might have been a big animal, so I ran straight towards the toilet. I closed the door quickly behind me. After catching my breath, I peeked from its little window. I heard more loud movement. It did sound like a big animal right behind the toilet. More branches cracking. Then, a big splash. Something had just jumped into the lake. I thought the route was clear enough and slammed open the door. I started running back to the main cabin, not looking back. All of a sudden, I heard my dad's voice calling my name. I stopped and listened. I was now 100% sure that it was indeed my dad's voice. Before I turned my head towards the voice, I could see that our car was not in the driveway yet. I got chills and turned to where the voice came from. The lake. For my confusion, I saw my dad floating in the lake, absolutely still, with a frozen smile on his face. For a moment, I thought that he hadn't left after all. Come here, he was shouting, again and again, with the same stiff voice. I saw no movement in the water. It's like he had stood there, but he was way too far from the coast for his or anyone's legs to reach the bottom. I realized almost immediately that this was not my dad. My legs went numb of the fear, but I got back to the main cabin. Crying my eyes out of panic, I was too afraid to look out the window and just locked the doors. My sister was still asleep, and just when I was about to wake her up, I heard a car. I looked from the kitchen window and soon saw my mom, brother, and my dad coming out of the car, smiling and laughing. My whole body was cold. The whole situation felt unreal. I asked my father later, had he had been in the water before, and he was confused. I tried to forget what I saw and heard, but I can't. I wasn't dreaming. It was something I can't explain logically. I'm 24 years old now, and I'm still afraid that I will someday experience something like this again. I try not to think what would have happened if I had followed him into the water. Back when I was in university, I used to work nights at a pub just a few miles from my parents' house. We lived out in the countryside, so I had to commute to nearby Leeds on weekday mornings, whilst at the weekends I'd spend my nights earning much needed beer money. The point is, when my late shift at the pub ended, I'd have to walk about two and a half miles along narrow, poorly lit country lanes in order to get home. Yeah, we had a taxi service in a village nearby, but on a weekend, it's pretty much fully booked at all times. That, and I didn't fancy blowing my nightly wages on a taxi 
at the end of every shift. I was frugal like that. One of the great things about working pubs in the countryside is that the tips are phenomenal. The sense of community and old-fashioned values meant that farmhands and landed gentry alike would always tip on their orders. Sometimes it was the take-your-own-amount of about 20 pence, but sometimes they'd leave you with maybe 4 or 5 pounds of change, especially when they'd had a few too many and were feeling overly generous. My shift usually ended about 11.30 p.m., once last orders had been called and we'd cleaned down the bars. All the staff would then usually hang around for a drink until about midnight before going our separate ways. Now, this one Saturday in particular had been insanely busy. The weather had been spectacular, and there had been some kind of garden festival in the area. This meant that all kinds of people from near and far had rolled through the pub and added to my tips glass. By the end of the night, I had 112 pounds. It was more money than I'd ever had in my life, and I'd be damned if I were to waste it on a taxi, especially when a belly full of lager would see me home. No problems. So off I went, merrily meandering homewards, feeling like a very rich man as I planned how to spend my newfound fortune. It was dark out, like really dark, with only a silver on moon in the sky to light my way. But I was just too buzzed and cheerful to care. It didn't occur to me once that I would be in any kind of danger. About a mile into the journey back home, I'm blasting some ACDC in my earphones when I see the lights of a car coming up behind me. It passes slowly, and for a second, I think the driver is about to ask for directions, but the car just keeps going. Like I said, we had had a lot of city folk passing through the village since the festival was on, so I thought nothing of not being able to recognize the vehicle or its driver. But once the car had passed me by about 200 yards or so, it just stops in the middle of the road. I watch it sitting for a minute or so, continuing on my merry way until it dawns on me that it's not going to just drive off. I got the weirdest feeling that it was sitting there, waiting for me. I know that sounds paranoid, but sometimes you just get a bad feeling about something, don't you? A kind of tight feeling in your stomach that tells you something is badly wrong. So I too stopped walking at the side of the road, just stood there staring at the car's rear lights until it finally revved its engine and took off into the night. I wasn't freaked out, but I think I can thank the belly full of beer for that. If this had happened while I was sober, I know I would have been much more scared. I'm not some big tough guy, like, at all. So when a couple of minutes go by and I see a pair of headlights coming at me from the opposite side of the road, I'm not worried in the slightest. I just keep walking as the car passes me, but I realize as it does so that it is indeed the same car from before. And just like before, it stops just a couple hundred yards down the road from me. I'm now convinced that it's a car full of city folk who have managed to get lost in the dark. So again, I stop at the side of the road, waiting for it to reverse so the driver can ask directions. Only it doesn't. The car does a U-turn in the middle of the lane, then switches its headlights off and begins to creep slowly down the road toward me. I wasn't freaked out before, but I was now. In fact, I'm not afraid to admit that I was completely and utterly terrified. I had no idea what exactly the driver's intentions were, but they were obviously not good. My head was spinning with grim ideas of what they were planning, flashes of robbery, kidnapping, and worse. I just started running, looking for a gap in the hedgerows so I could jump into one of the nearby fields to hide. I finally found one, scrambling over the dry stone wall and badly scraping my elbows in the process. My first thought was to grab my phone from my backpack to call the police, but the light of the screen 
meant that the driver would be able to find me pretty quickly. I panicked, threw it back into my bag, and decided that hiding was my best option. Even if I did get through to the police, it would take them a while to get here. It might be too late by then. So I'm crouching in the base of a hedge, terrified out of my mind, just trying to hide so that the driver just thinks that I have run off into the fields. The only thing I'm relying on at this point is my sense of hearing. I'm listening for footsteps, the car's engine, anything to give me an idea of what's happening on the other side of the hedge. I know it's cliché, but a couple of minutes passing really did feel like a half an hour, and in that time I hadn't heard a single thing coming from the road. When it got to the point that I felt it was safe to check, I started to slowly edge up towards the section of the hedge that I dove over, readying myself to peek over the dry stone wall for any signs of the car. It's right then I heard the sound of car doors slamming. Not one, but two or three, all closing at once. The car hadn't moved. That whole time they had been sat in the middle of the dark country lane, waiting for me to emerge. My heart was pounding at that point. I can't convey just how terrifying it is to know you're being hunted by a gang of complete strangers. I just bolt, hurtling across the dark field in the direction of a small wooded area. I know the area quite well, so despite me not knowing exactly where I would end up, it really didn't matter by that point. It was either leg it or face being caught by the people hunting me. I hid out in the woods for as long as I could, watching the field I had just crossed for shadows or torches. But again, there seemed to be nothing. When the coast was clear, I took off in the opposite direction I had come from, crossing fields and staying off the roads until I could find my way back home. Even though it was the middle of the night, I woke my mom and dad and told them exactly what happened. Naturally, they called the police and arranged for some officers to visit the next morning so I could give a description. A month or so went by and we heard nothing back. I had stopped walking home and started ponying up for taxis just to make sure I made it back safe. But I was actually managing to forget about what had happened or at least let it slip to the back of my mind. That's when the police called back. The people had been arrested after committing an assault on an elderly man just a few villages away from us. They were part of a gang, based in nearby Leeds, who would drive out into the country at night where there are hardly any CCTV cameras before assaulting people as part of some gang initiation. I was glad they had all been caught but it still really bothers me that some people seem to be so willing to commit violence against a total stranger. I still walk places at night sometimes, but I don't use noise-canceling headphones anymore, and I always carry a small knife, just in case. If you work night shifts too, I'd recommend you do the same. You never know who's out there, lurking in the darkness just waiting to make someone a victim. I was living at my friend's in a smaller sized trailer, and the only other two people that lived there were him and his dad. One day I had just gotten home from work, and no one was there. I knew they were at work, so I threw my clothes and towel on the toilet seat and jumped in the shower. Since I was alone, I left the bathroom door open. A few minutes later I heard my name being called from the living room, and figured one of them had come back as they both sound pretty similar. I answered, What? And didn't hear anything. I continued my shower, and a few minutes later, I heard my name being called again. This time, I turned the water off and answered, In the bathroom! No response. I got out of the shower and reached for my towel. It wasn't there. 
It was neatly folded on the towel rack across the room. Thinking my friend was just playing a prank, I quickly dried off and got dressed. But when I went out to look, both of their cars were still gone, and the front door was still locked. It was 1992, and I was 16 years old. I lived with my parents in a small coastal town in Oregon. Lots of dunes, beaches, rivers, very pretty, but also a lot of transient traffic, tourists, hitchhikers, that sort of thing. The town I grew up in consisted of fishermen and loggers. Everyone pretty much knew everyone, so for the most part, I felt safe. I was working at a fancy fish restaurant in the tiny town of Charleston that sat right in the harbor off the main dock. It was about 15 miles from my house. I only worked a couple nights a week, and my parents would just let me drive their car. I wasn't old enough to serve alcohol, so I worked as a busser. Each server got their own busser, and then at the end of the night, they tipped us out. This new guy named John moves to town from New York City. I always worked his shifts, and we got along really well. So after the first few weeks, he started picking me to be his busser, which was great. I liked him because he was good at his job, and always tipped me out really well. One night we were way busier than usual, and it took us a really long time to do our side work. It was well after midnight when we finally finished so he offered to walk me to my car. It was unnecessary, but I allowed him to do so. I grabbed my stuff, and we walked out the back kitchen door. My car was parked in our almost totally empty gravel parking lot. I hopped into the driver's seat of my little Nissan Sentra and started digging through my bag for my keys. All of a sudden, his eyes got all wide, and he says, Why isn't your door locked? Are you crazy? I laughed. Well, yeah, of course my doors are unlocked. I never lock them. John looked totally mortified. Why not? He asked. Why would I? I retorted. Stone-faced John then sternly tells me to lock my door. I started to giggle, and in jest, I put my hands up as if to tell him to relax. I reach over and smack the lock down so that he sees it. Then I made a catty comment, something to the effect of, Relax, you're not in New York City anymore, John. But this wasn't good enough. He then walked around the front of my car and casually opened my passenger door, snaps the lock down, and then shuts the door, and with a smile of victory, walks back inside of the building. I'm still laughing as I drive off. You gotta love those big city people. It was almost 1 a.m. at this point. Usually I'm done and home by midnight, but I made a lot of money and I was in a super good mood, so I turned up the stereo and headed home. There are two ways for me to get home. There is a main road that is well lit and well traveled, but goes all the way around the town, forcing me to loop back around to finally get me home. The second route is Libby Lane, which is adjacent off of Seven Devils Road, which is linked to almost as many urban legends as Route 666. A road I would never walk on at night, and many people avoid driving it, even during the day. But Libby Lane was also by far the shortest route home, as it cut straight through the forest and dropped me off very close to my house. Libby Lane was not lit with lampposts, and due to its curvy, narrow lanes, was pretty much only traveled by locals. It was quiet and oftentimes I would drive all the way home without seeing another vehicle, as large stretches of this road were just desolate. I grew up hearing all kinds of stories about these two roads, everything from boogeymen to satanic worship rituals, even UFO sightings. But I don't scare easily, and I sort of liked the creepy feeling of seeing the shadows and darkness of the night engulf my car as I glanced into my rearview mirror. I found it somewhat thrilling. It was a feeling that made me realize how secluded the world can still be, 
and how tiny I was in it. I get about halfway home, and it was super dark. No moon out, so all I could see was my headlights illuminated in front of me. Out of nowhere, I saw an old Monte Carlo parked in the middle of the lane with its hazard lights on. I could see the blinking red lights from a ways off, and I didn't immediately get suspicious. It was about ten yards ahead of me when I slowed down to a crawl. As I got closer, it struck me as odd that the car was not just in the middle of the road, but it was parked diagonally across both lanes, making it very difficult to get around. Still, I just figured he spun out or something. As my car edged closer, I noticed that standing in front of the Monte Carlo was a very tall man, who was at least 6'4", lean, and wearing a long black coat. When he saw my lights, he started casually waving his arms up and down at me. Keep in mind that I lived in a town where most locals knew each other or were at least familiar, and this guy was not from here. That much I knew for sure, so I had no intention of letting him inside my car. However, I did intend on stopping to let him know that I would call him a tow as soon as I got home. This incident happened in the 90s before cell phones were a thing. As I slow even more, I see him walking up to the passenger side door. I came to a full stop and reach over to start rolling down the window. This was a big mistake. Everything from here on happened so fast. The minute my car was at a full stop, his casual walk turned into a sprint as he made a mad dash toward the door handle. He yanked on it once, immediately realized that my door was locked, and then flew into a fit of rage like I had never seen. Using his left hand to continue pulling on the handle, the man makes a fist with his free hand and starts punching the window really hard in an obvious attempt to shatter the glass. I was totally caught off guard, and I just started screaming. My heart jumped into my throat, and the next thing I knew, I was in full panic mode. I slammed my car into gear and let off the clutch so fast, I almost stalled out. I had to swerve because this Monte Carlo was like a big boat, and it was blocking most of the lane. I took the risk of driving onto the soft shoulder in order to get around his car. Thank God I didn't get stuck, because he would have eventually broke the window. I was sure of that. The whole time I'm driving around his vehicle, he was running beside my car, still punching at the windows and pulling on the door. I was close enough to his car that he actually ran into his own front bumper, forcing him to let go of my door handle. I remember driving like a maniac, staring into my rearview mirror, just waiting to see the headlights of his car barreling down on me. I still had a good 15 minute drive to make it home. I swear, it was the longest 15 minutes of my life. He did not follow me. At least I don't think he did. Then again, I knew that road like the back of my hand, so I was pretty sure that I could drive it a lot faster than he could. That didn't make the terror I felt any less though. I got home, ran into the house shaking, and totally unnerved. I called the police and told them everything. The police drove out to the spot that same night, but found nothing. Not a single trace. When they spoke to me, they asked me if he said anything to me, or if I knew him. It was then that I felt a little perplexed as I thought back. You would think that he would have yelled at me to stop, or to get out of the car, or even just scream. But he didn't. In fact, the man never uttered a single word and didn't make any noise at all, at least not that I could hear. The whole experience was horrifying, but that tiny piece of it was so bizarre. I never saw the car or that man again, but my next work shift, I hugged John tight and thanked him profusely. Had he not insisted that I lock my passenger side door, I probably wouldn't be here today. I grew up in a small city in Oklahoma 
with nothing much to do for kids my age. I wasn't young enough to be playing G.I. Joes in the yard, but I also wasn't old enough to drive to Tulsa to see a concert or something similar. What adults don't consider in places like that is when kids are left alone to find a way to entertain themselves, the thing they discover often gets them into trouble, or sometimes even hurt. It was sometime in 1990, myself, my brother, and his friend were bored out of our minds. We were on summer break from school and had been looking for something fun to do. This was before the time of online multiplayer gaming, and my friends and I couldn't spend all day inside playing them. Honestly, if they would have been around, we likely would have done it. Although, I'm constantly on my son's back to get outside and experience the real world. I would have loved to have had those games when I was his age. Sick of flattening pennies on the railroad tracks, we were desperate to think of something to do. We threw out ideas one at a time, until my brother suggested the idea of exploring in the old mall. I had known a few kids around town who had been inside of it, but I had always been kind of scared to check it out. When my brother suggested this, I agreed. Not because I wanted to, but rather because I didn't want to look like a wuss in front of the other kids. They were all younger than me, and they would never let me live it down. I swallowed the lump in my throat and led the way through downtown and toward the older business district, where most of the newer stores had opened in the 70s and 80s. With the new highway coming in, the majority of those stores moved closer to it, and the old area died a slow death. One of those dead businesses was the new mall they had opened on the same spot as the original in 1976. By the time I have any memories of the place, its days were already numbered. Rumors of a new bigger and more modern mall with a multi-screen movie theater began spreading, and in 1985 when the ground was broken on it, just off of the brand new highway, the opening of the new mall a year and a half later, was the final nail in its coffin. By the Christmas holidays of 1987, all the stores had moved to the new mall, and the doors were locked soon after. We did our best to make sure no one saw us walking toward the old building by taking the long way around to the back to enter. Once we had pried the boards back from the door frame, we were inside. Even though it was a little dark and messy, it looked almost just like I had remembered it. I told everyone to stick close together so that we wouldn't get lost, and despite the overcoming urge, they all had to run off and explore on their own. I think the immense size of the place scared them more than they would ever let on. When my brother spotted one of the fountains, I happened to mention that people would make a wish and throw pennies in them. Upon hearing the money part, he and his friend ran off toward it to see if the pennies were still there. Of course, they weren't. I couldn't stop laughing for a long time, at least until I thought I noticed some movement off in the distance. Naturally, my brother and his friend wanted to go in that direction, so we did. Exploring turned out to be not as cool as I had hoped. Most of the storefronts were covered with heavy steel gates that were impenetrable to a group of kids. We continued heading north towards the old J.C. Penney's until we noticed the gate on the arcade was open. As you can imagine, no games were left behind. It was nothing more than a big empty space with a restroom and a back room for an office. Since others had been there before us, the place was already trashed. But somehow, my brother found an unbroken sink on the restroom floor and smashed it against another broken one. The office was filled with old clothes and sleeping bags. This was the first time I had thought of people living in the building, and I got a chill down my back. I prayed to myself that no one was there, while we were. Stories of kids disappearing in old houses started going through my head, and I suggested that we leave. We left the empty arcade and continued toward Penny's. A few minutes later, we reached the old Gap store, 
and we found a hole big enough for us to squeeze through the gate. It was basically like the arcade inside. Old clothes and trash were spread everywhere. We decided to leave and look elsewhere. I had a little harder time squeezing my big fat ass through on the way out. After a bit of a struggle, I made it. When I stood up, I saw a man standing in front of the old J.C. Penny. A jolt of fear went through me, and I was frozen stiff. He just stood there, watching me intently. I could hear my brother and his friend behind me bickering about something, but I was too scared to say anything. The man kept watching until he noticed my brother squeeze out behind me, followed by his friend. That's when he started yelling at us and running in our direction. My brother's friend was only halfway out of the hole when this guy started running. My first instinct was to run, and I did, but quickly remembered the other two with me. My brother was still back at the gate trying to yank his buddy out of the hole. His foot was hung up on something. The entire time this was going on, the man was getting closer. I was too scared to wait any longer and ran back to the gate and grabbed and ripped him out from the hole. We got away just in time, it seemed. I was now running as fast as I could. My brother and his friend were, fortunately, right behind me. Unfortunately, the man was hot on their heels. I knew if I slowed down even just a little, he would catch us, and God knows what he would do if he did. In less than a minute, we were back at the front doors and crawling out as quick as we could. I watched anxiously as my brother and his buddy came out one by one after me. Before I could take a breath, I heard a man's voice say, Well now, what are you boys up to? I looked up to see a pair of police officers standing at the curb next to their car. I wasn't sure whether to be happy or not. I kept my mouth shut as one of them waved us over to him. This entire time, I'm expecting that man to come crawling out from behind the plywood on the door, but he never did. As we walked over to the officer, I told the other two, under my breath, to not say anything and let me talk. The officers met us halfway and continued to ask us about what we were doing. I only said that we were bored so we went to look around, but we didn't see anything and we were going back home. Just as I finished my sentence, my brother's friend started to say something about the man chasing us, but I nudged him in the ribs and whispered to him to shut up. There was no way I was going to tell them I ran away from an adult who could have been a police officer like them. Where I grew up, we were far less afraid of the police than we were of our parents. I can guarantee if they found out my brother and I ran away from a policeman, we would have both gotten a major whipping. I wasn't especially concerned about my brother getting spanked, but I would do anything to avoid a hiding from my dad. And don't get me wrong, our father never abused us. We came from a loving home. But whenever we made a big mistake, we knew a few whacks from his giant hands were soon to follow. Anyhow, what followed was the usual serious talking to about dangerous old places and responsibility. Then, the officers drove us home. To my relief, my folks were both at work at the time, so they never heard about our trespassing incident. I was scared the police would call them or come by for about a week, but they never did. Although my brother and I did talk about it that night before bed, we never really figured out if that man in the mall was a policeman or not. The officers never said a word about him to us, so I didn't think he was. Once I arrived at that conclusion, the fear I first felt when I saw him began to creep back. I said nothing to my brother about this. It would have just scared him even more, and he may have told our parents, and I definitely didn't want that. None of us ever went back to the old mall. I didn't, and I never heard anyone else mention it. I also never saw that man that chased us again. We went on to other legally questionable things to occupy us, and before I realized it, school started again. Over the years, 
I would hear crazy stories about the abandoned old mall. One or two people said there were satanic rituals going on there. Another rumor talked about it being haunted. I ignored most of them, but a news report about a girl being abducted and taken there to be raped did catch my attention. She stated that the man carried her into the abandoned pennies and assaulted her. I wondered for a little while if it was the same man, but I never saw a picture or anything else, so I let it go. In 2005, when the city finally made the decision to bulldoze the old place, I supported it fully. A plan to restore the building and make it some sort of exhibition hall was thrown around briefly, but it ultimately went nowhere. I went down there the day of the demolition and took a few pictures. Seeing that old, rotten building go down filled me with a bit of belated relief. It seemed to serve as some type of way to close the book on a terrifying chapter from my past, regardless of how minor it might have been in hindsight. Not to mention, the very idea of my son going into that dump all these years later scared me far more than any yelling and crazed man ever could have. This is a true story that happened several years back when I was 13. This was a time when I was growing up in New York. We actually had a summer house on Cape Cod and spent every other weekend there if we could. Cape Cod is a peninsula off the east coast of Massachusetts. It becomes very busy, even crowded during summertime. But during the winter season, it becomes empty. The majority of houses in our area are owned as summer houses. So during the winter, the houses are still there, but the people are not. In contrast to New York, there are only street lamps on the single main road in this town. The main road goes from the town center to the beach. Aside from this road, all of the others are dark and very black at night. Also, Cape Cod extends out into the Atlantic from the mainland, forming a bay. Cape Cod Bay. Not only can one watch the sunrise over the Atlantic Ocean, but can watch the sunset over Cape Cod Bay on any given clear day. Another effect of being surrounded by ocean is that there is very little man-made light at night. The stars are so clear that the Milky Way is clearly visible, spanning across the sky on clear nights. This story happened during the vacation period between Christmas and the New Year. The Christmas celebrations were finished. There was plenty of leftover turkey and pumpkin pie. We got a bit of cabin fever with all the Christmas food and family on one evening. My older sister, who is seven years older than I, 20 at the time, came up with an idea to take a walk to the harbor, which was about a 20 minute walk from our house. The harbor can be fun because we can walk out onto the docks and walk among the boats. While I was a bit creeped out to walk around a deserted beach town on a cold winter night, I also thought it would be fun to get out of the house and maybe even be exciting. We headed out. Across the street from our classic Cape Cod cottage is a field with a forest at the other end. At nighttime, I would also have a little fear that there could be a psycho watching from the tall grass. Perhaps he would have an axe. But while it kept my nerves weary, I knew it was my imagination. But still, icy wind blowing on tall grass is a perfect setting for some scary activity. Add to this a moonless sky with a million sparkling stars and the Milky Way above, and the horror setting is at level Stephen King. We walked out to the main road, went a bit down to the road and then turned to walk down a side street that leads to the street that dips downhill toward the harbor. This side street runs along the backside of a long hotel. It's more like a two-level motel, painted light yellow, that has a pool. It is well situated in town, so can be full of life during summer. 
On this December eve, the hotel was closed for the season, completely dark, and several windows are covered with plywood for protection. My sister mentioned that a hotel that spans an entire block, but is partially boarded, reminds her of a horror movie. Like one of those slasher films, where the characters make all the wrong decisions, and walks into the worst of dark places, just to find their worst nightmare come true. At the end of the street with the hotel, we continued to the left, which is a long road downhill through the woods to the harbor. This isn't a pure forest, because there are houses set back from the road with an occasional driveway. Many of the driveways have reflectors on a rock, a fence, or just standing on a metal stick. These reflectors reflect back the headlights from cars. I mention this because we could not see any of them or anything. It was pitch black in the wooded area, and the road seemed to continue into the black. Come to think of it, we had not seen a single car, or a single person, or a single sign of life since we left our house. My nerves were on edge. I was only 13 at the time, and although my nerves were screaming, I tried to stay calm, because I wanted to seem tough to my sister. The woods alongside the road were particularly nerve-wracking. The trees come right up to the asphalt on each side of the road. They provide many opportunities to hide someone, or something. The houses beyond the woods were dark, because rarely did vacationers come here in winter. I started to notice that my sister was also starting to lose her nerves, and that's when I felt it. I felt a flush of energy move up the back of my neck. It makes it feel like the hairs are sticking out on end. This is a feeling I get when I am being watched. It's hard to describe this feeling, but I still get it today. Sometimes when someone is looking at me from behind, it's either some kind of sixth sense or it's just my imagination working with some intuition. We were now midway into the wooded area down the hill toward the harbor. I was starting to lose my shit, and I was just about to stop pretending not to be freaking out and tell my sister, let's go back, when she suggested it. She said, it's late, maybe we don't have to go all the way to the harbor. I replied back, yeah, plus it's creepy. The back of my neck was shivering, and I felt my body shudder as it wrestled between acting relaxed and flipping the switch to fight or flight mode. My sister replied, Yeah, really creepy. Come on, let's go back to the house. We can see the harbor tomorrow. We turned around and she grabbed my hand and we started walking fast back uphill. I remember that she held my hand so tight it hurt and my sister never holds my hand. I can't think of another time she did this, and this is where the story takes a deep dive down the rabbit hole. As we get towards the end of the wooded area, my sister screamed out, I've got a knife and I'm not afraid to use it, and she did not lose any rhythm of her fast walk while saying this. We crossed the street now and headed onto the street with the backside of the closed, two-level motel. My sister continues speed walking and looks back. She let out a little panic noise and looked back again. She then commanded me, don't look back. I was utterly freaking out at this point. Aside from the eerie vibe of the dark empty street and my own inner panic, I had not actually seen anything out of the ordinary, with the exception of my sister's completely insane behavior. Then she said, when I say run, you run, okay? Okay. We were almost at the main road, a block from our street. And she said, Run! We booked it. She let go of my hand, and we both broke into a full sprint. I could hear our footsteps banging the asphalt, and could also hear several other steps banging in the distance behind us. We cut around the grassy area to a shortcut towards the street 
and ran through the front yards of our neighbor's house to make a beeline for the front door to our house. We made it. We both ran in and locked the storm door, which is mostly glass. I was panicking, but not sure if there was anything, or if we were just going crazy. It was a strange transition from outside, which was terrifying, to inside the warm lit house, which seemed safe. I was questioning what happened in my mind. I could sense that my sister was also questioning herself, whether there even was a threat, or we both just lost our minds out there. I asked my sister what she saw, and she said there was a man that was standing at the edge of one of the driveways. We walked right by him on the way back. She said that when we were behind the hotel, he crossed the street and started following us. She said he was looking right at us and although we were walking very fast, he was gaining on us. She explained that it doesn't make sense that a man would be standing out there in the dark wooded area. Honestly, I really don't understand what happened that night. I am not sure how much of what my sister said is true, if she saw something or not. One thing is for sure, I realized that I prefer walking to that harbor during daylight. I am a 23 year old woman and I am half Cherokee from Georgia, USA. At the time that this story took place, my fiance and I were living on a large farm in Maryland. We didn't use the farm, but we were renting a small house on the property and we were free to come and go around the grounds. I was only 19 at the time this took place and the only residents in our home were myself, my fiance, and our cat and dog. Our cat was a lunatic barn cat that I had rescued because I can't say no to animals that need help. And our dog was my loyal pit bull who was a sweet, cuddly, scaredy cat. She weighed about 75 pounds and is afraid of her own shadow. Our farm was situated on about 20 acres of land and our driveway was about a half a mile long. So usually when I would get home from work, my loyal dog and I would go for a walk and I usually brought my fiancé with me. Not that I was afraid to go out alone, just that he spends too much time playing games and after our driveway was a 12 mile long road through woods and farms until it finally reconnected with civilization. So it was safe to say that we were far, far from other people except for our landlord of course. The first miles were through farmland followed by a brief patch of forest, and then about a half mile of wheat fields, and then solid forest for two more miles. Now that you have a bit of the layout, on to the story. It started off like any other weekday evening. My fiancé and I returned home from work to our happy cottage and happy pets. Harley, our dog, was frantic to go for a walk, so I quieted her and changed into walking clothes and asked if my fiance would join me. He had gotten home shortly after me and he said that he had seen one of the coyotes that we have around close to our field by our house. But as you may know, coyotes are mostly scavengers, especially out here on the east coast. So I wasn't too worried and I am very capable of defending myself. I called him a wuss and then told Harley that we could go and that we would be fine without him. Laughing to myself, we left the cottage and started walking toward the driveway. The sun was going down, and the October air had started to get a chill to it, and it rustled through the cornfields next to our long driveway. The corn was about six feet tall at this point in the year, and impossible to see through, so I assumed that my fiancé was just trying to scare me, because there was no way he could have seen a coyote in this field. Harley was enjoying her time in the field, tearing in and out of the corn stalks on our walks up the driveway, and I knew that with as big of a coward as she was, that she would alert me to any danger very quickly and by running away. By the time I reached the end of the driveway, the sun had set and the moon, which had already come out, 
was shining high about the fields. It wasn't quite full, but it provided enough light that I didn't need to use my flashlight or Harley's collar light. We turned left down the road and proceeded across the first section of field. The first field was soybeans, and if you don't know, they are relatively short plants that nothing but a rabbit could hide in. And off in the distance, I spotted a few deer, but nothing alarming, so we relaxed and enjoyed our walk through the night air. I threw a stick and Harley brought it back over and over again. Typical dog and owner stuff. We reached the first small section of trees, and Harley stopped and bumped into my leg, letting me know there was something ahead. We continued our walk and passed into the next field. This was a wheat field, and the wheat was about ready for harvest, so it was quite tall and hard to see through. The field was quiet though, and Harley didn't do anything, so I figured that the coyotes had passed on, if there had been any at all. Now this is the part you have been waiting for, and I don't know what it was, but here it is. We rounded the corner of the field and into an area with wheat in our left and forest on our right, and the air seemed to go still. Harley got closer to me, and I heard rustling in the wheat field. I saw three tails circling back toward the forest. Coyotes. The eastern coyotes are small, but in a pack, they are pretty ballsy. Harley raised her heckles and I yelled, Get out of here! Go on! as loud as I could, and the coyotes, startled, scattered off into the trees. I decided to turn around and get out of there before they decided to regroup, because I am brave, but I'm not going to walk into a darkened forest with a coyote pack and a cowardly pit bull. We turned to head back and again I heard a rustling in the wheat. A confused coyote? I thought that it must be but no. Harley was standing stock, still staring at the wheat, and I whistled for her to come with me, that high-pitched, ear-piercing, two-fingered whistle. That snapped her out of it for a second, when my whistle was returned from inside the wheat. All of a sudden, all of the family legends I had heard came flooding back to me, and I expected to see a tall, thin creature emerge but nothing did. I didn't smell rotting meat or feel a sense of dread. Instead, I was transfixed with fear and curiosity. I whistled again. The whistle was returned again. Very human sounding, but at the same time, not. Against my better judgment, I said, Hello? My own voice replied, Hello. My hand on my knife, I said, Show yourself. Silence. No bugs, no coyotes, no Harley noises, just my own breath. Slowly the rustling started again, and I turned on my flashlight. I shined it on the wheat field, and what I saw confuses me to this day animal eyes. That green-yellow reflection of light was cast back at me, but what it was connected to didn't make sense. There was a girl, no more than 14 or 15 years old, crouched in the wheat. She wore what I think must have been some kind of deer skin or fur. She was very thin and looked as though her skin had never seen sunlight. Her hair was long and tangled with wheat and leaves. Under any other circumstances, I would have said she was beautiful, but at this moment, she was terrifying. We stared at each other for what must have been a solid minute or so, but felt like much longer, until I heard the unmistakable coyote howl from the forest. Both of our heads snapped toward the noise, and I immediately heard her take off through the wheat, toward the sound. At that same moment, Harley took off toward our house, and I went after her. We didn't stop running until we got to the driveway. 
and I stopped, not wanting my fiancé to know I was running away from something. I could still hear the howling in the distance, and we started walking at a brisk pace. We made it back to the cottage with no further problems, and I didn't tell my fiancé about it, not wanting him to go out with a gun. She hadn't hurt me, so I didn't think it right to hunt her. I wasn't even quite sure what I saw. I was awoken in the middle of the night that night by the sound of the coyotes outside our cottage. This wasn't unusual, but now I wondered if she was with them. When I was coming home from work about a month later, I had stopped obsessing about that night, and I almost thought that I imagined it when I had to slam on my brakes for something in the road. It was dark, and when my headlights hit it, its eyes reflected green and yellow. It was a large coyote. It just stared at my car for a moment, and then ran off into the woods. I know this sounds crazy, but I still wonder if that was the girl. When I was seven, I lived in a dusty, vacant part of the West, with an atmosphere straight out of a Judy Bloom novel. Despite everyone in my neighborhood living on large, isolated plots of land, mostly being ranching families, kids played hockey in the streets, crime was minimal to non-existent, and everybody knew everybody else. I had a tight-knit group of friends. Names changed to protect privacy. Let's call them Shirley, Natalie, and Bailey. We'd been friends since before we could walk, mostly because we were the same age and all lived in the same neighborhood. We weren't idiots, but we were definitely sheltered. The same could be said of our parents, many of whom ended their education after high school, or even a bit sooner, and grew up in similar, if not the exact same, community, where anyone who'd shake your hand was probably trustworthy. That's why no one noticed anything before it was too late. Just before the summer had started, a new family moved in. Families moving in wasn't terribly uncommon, but this family had a girl my and my friend's age, so it became a big deal. Her name was Ella, and her whole family was a bit strange. It took two weeks for them to introduce themselves to anyone. Plenty of people went over to introduce themselves, but even when it was obvious people were home, nobody ever came to the door. Finally, word got around that the father was a minister at some church that no one in town had heard of, and his wife was working part-time at the tailor. And we spent a lot of time outside, and eventually spotted Ella. My friends and I invited her to join our group in whatever we were up to that afternoon. Through that, we learned she had four older brothers and an infant sister. She and her whole family had very antiquated gender roles, prayed before and about virtually anything they did, and would casually mention the end of the world as a non-sequitur. Despite this, they managed to somehow establish themselves as pillars of the community. The father, let's call him Mr. Cyrus, came to every town hall, and his wife, Mrs. Cyrus, took up leadership role in the PTA. I think their wholesome Christian image helped to fray what would have otherwise been deeply troubling outbursts of rage, which Mr. Cyrus would exhibit, sometimes right out in public. He'd hear another adult use a phrase like, God damn it, and fly into a frenzy about how dare they forsake our Lord and Savior, taking his name in vain. His wife would make unsolicited judgmental comments about how other people raise their kids, especially daughters. Despite all that, within a few months you'd never know they hadn't lived there all their lives. The unspoken understanding in this town was if you left your kids in someone else's care, they had free reign to do whatever they thought best for them, and feed them, instruct them, or discipline them, same as if you were their own. And the first time I went to Ella's, nothing out of the ordinary happened. And the second time, Mr. Cyrus led all of us in prayer before we ate our snack, and afterward. I mentioned to my mom how I found it infuriating, and she basically said, their house, their rules. I shrugged it off. 
neither of us had any way to know Mr. Cyrus was testing the waters. A few weeks later, several of our families had gotten together, and Mr. Cyrus brought a rifle out of nowhere and asked us girls if we wanted to shoot some cans. He said to the parents once he'd gotten us excited, I mean, if you're comfortable with guns. Remember, this is rural America. Not one of us girls hadn't already fired a gun in our lives, and if any of the parents were uncomfortable about guns, they would never admit so in public. Things progressed little by little every time I went over. Within the next few visits, my friends and I were made to participate in a mini Bible study session. I guess one of the other girls had told their parents about the praying, because when we were dropped off, Mr. Cyrus said, Oh, I forgot to mention, Eileen and I had a family Bible study planned for tonight. If you're uncomfortable with that, you can bring the girls back another night. This was the West in the 80s. Christianity was the default, and even people who didn't really practice felt obligated to pretend they did. No one in this town would have objected to their kids participating in a Bible study loud enough for anyone to hear. It didn't even matter, because it was sort of fun. None of us complained about it, and we all seen how Ella seemed into it, and wouldn't have wanted to hurt her feelings by complaining. I think Mr. Cyrus took that as one of the final go-aheads needed. In late August, Miss Cyrus called my and my friend's parents, and asked if we wanted to have a sleepover with Ella. Everyone agreed. The first red flag flew up right away. Most of us girls spent half our days off from school doing farm chores and helping around the house, so we were all in jeans. I had never seen Ella in pants, ever, but what we wore had never been any sort of problem. When we got there this time, though, Ella had laid out four of her dresses on the bed and told us to change into them to look more like girls. We all liked playing dress-up, so changed without complaint. But when we went downstairs, Mr. Cyrus said, Look how ladylike you all are now. Doesn't that feel better? You've made God very happy. At this point in a play date, we'd usually go out back and make mud pies or play tag or something. But instead, Mr. Cyrus jumped right into a Bible lesson. He was basically giving a sermon and talked about heaven and hell and the ways to get into heaven and the ways to go to hell. He scared our seven-year-old minds half to death about the fires of hell. Then he did what I can only describe as a cartoony attempt at hypnosis. This was years ago, so it's a little fuzzy, but he dangled some piece of jewelry like a necklace or something in front of us and swung it back and forth. While he did that, he recited Bible verses about telling the truth and repentance and the end times, clean souls entering the glory of heaven. Then he sat us all down on a couch. We were all roughly freaked out at this point because of the heaven-hell talk. We figured everything was just a religious ritual of their home, because he'd so carefully desensitized us over the past few months. He talked about sin and repentance, and asked us if we wanted to go to heaven or hell. I think you can guess what we all said. He said the only way to get into heaven was to be baptized. One of my friends, Shirley, said she'd already been baptized, but Mr. Cyrus cut them off. Baptized into the real faith, God's faith. He asked if we wanted to know how we could become baptized, and we all said yes. He said by confessing our sins and making them right with God, committing to living in a Christian-like way, and most importantly, accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It sounded easy enough to us. For the next I don't know how long, there were no clocks in the house and it was after dark by then. We basically did an intense Bible study. It could have been anywhere between ten minutes and four hours. When you're little and not accustomed to going to church, any amount of Bible study feels like an eternity. This was interspersed with different prayers for our salvation and making promises about rejecting sin and resisting temptation. We were all getting very tired and feeling our patience wearing thin for tolerating others' religious beliefs. Then there was a whole bunch of prepper stuff different types of guns, talking about growing your own food, the importance of self-reliance, basically a lecture on survival skills, but with constant emphasis that the greatest survival skill is being a good Christian. He kept us up most of the night after that, praying and such. He did some ritual stuff with rubbing oil on our foreheads. He vaguely talked on and off throughout the night about whether we'd want to go with Ella to a wonderful place, with lots of other kids who love Christ. 
He said he'd ask our parents about taking us there on a weekend trip. I knew when I was agreeing with him that I had no interest, but my mom had taught me the polite thing to do when you get an invitation to something you have no intention of going to is to smile and express interest. Then closer to the day, he'd say something came up, so I just smiled and expressed interest. He didn't feed us anything the entire time we were there. By the time it started to get light out, we were baptized in the backyard. Then we finally fell asleep, and a few hours later we were picked up. I told my mom I didn't want to go back because it was too religious for me. I told her we were up a lot of the night praying. I told my mom there was no food also, but since I was such a picky eater, she was too used to hearing they had nothing to eat, when really it was something like they served a meatloaf and wouldn't even make me a grilled cheese. We stopped playing with Ella, and just kind of put it behind us until high school, mentioning once every few years about that weirdly religious play date. Since we didn't really understand any of the promises we had made to Mr. Cyrus, we didn't pay half a mind to keeping any of them. We were exhausted and surrounded in daily life by Jesus' rhetoric that everyone took seriously in the moment and then ignored once the preacher was out of earshot. In high school, it was heavily rumored that Ella's father, Mr. Cyrus, at Florence Hutef, famed for her involvement with the controversial Branch Davidians, visiting his home and leading some sort of prayer circle for him and the people of his church. And while I still don't know if she really came to visit him, it was confirmed irrefutably in high school that Mr. Cyrus belonged to an offshoot of Shepherd's Rod, the Christian apocalyptic extremist group rooted in the Seventh-day Adventism. Nobody really talked to them much after that, in town even, because we all considered it a cult. I went out of state after high school, and I have no idea what happened with Ella's family after that. This happened just an hour ago. I'm a 21-year-old female in a small college town. It's in the country, and usually very safe. I've never felt uneasy before this. Here's my story. Sorry, it's probably sort of long and all jumbled because I'm still so worked up. I'm still shaking a bit, but I thought you guys would like this story and maybe learn a bit from me. Never to walk alone. I don't care how safe you think you'll be. My friend, who lives a street over from me, asked me to check in on her cat every day while she's gone for the weekend. At around seven, I walked over to her apartment. It was still light out at this time, and this walk is extremely easy on public streets of student housing. It doesn't take any more than five minutes. I didn't plan to stay very long, just to check the food and water and give some loving and come right back. But I got carried away, because I love this cat, and didn't leave until around 8.15ish. By this time it was dark already, and her street is very poorly lit. I had never noticed before. So I'm walking down the street, when I hear whistling behind me. Not a whistle tune, but just whistles like they were whistling to a dog. I ignore it because I honestly thought it was just a group of students going out to party or something. I hear a loud, Hey! Followed by more whistles. I look back and there's a man walking on the same side as me, but very far back, about a hundred yards away from me. I check my pocket because I think maybe I may have dropped something my keys or phone, and maybe he's trying to give them back? I check my pocket. Nope. I have all my things. I frequent this sub a lot and love crime shows, so red flags started to go off, but I honestly thought I was being a bit dramatic. I decided to just continue walking. I'm about halfway down the hill when I look back and see that he's much closer now. Speed walking down this hill, in my direction. Now I started panicking. I call my friend on FaceTime and start speed walking while telling her what's happening. I round the corner to go toward my house and look back. This guy is walking so fast he almost starts sprinting and we're now only about 30 yards away. 
I can't explain how far away he started and how close he suddenly seemed to me. I was terrified. I started sprinting. He had to have sprinted down that hill after me. At this point, I didn't know what to do. He was so close and it was dark. No one was on the street, and I couldn't outrun him to my house. I turned to face him, still about thirty yards away, when I see it's a tall man. This next part gives me chills. I scream at him, What do you want from me? And he doesn't answer. He completely ignores my screaming, and keeps running straight towards me. I was crying at this point, and desperate. I start knocking on a random person's door, praying to God that someone would answer. I'm knocking on this kid's door, and in between us is a car. Basically, the creepy guy has suddenly started walking very slowly behind me, and the car that separates us as I'm knocking on this random door. And the creepy man is standing right behind the car I'm in front of. By the grace of God, a kid opens his door, and I quickly ask to come in, explaining that a man is following me and that I'm terrified. As the kid starts to let me in, the creepy man sprints in the other direction. I completely lost it. I was crying and shaking on this kid's couch. I broke my flip-flop and cut open my toe while I was running away from this guy. My friend came to pick me up, and I called the police and filed a report. I wish I did so earlier while it was happening, but I was just so scared I didn't think of it. It honestly was the scariest thing to ever happen to me. And I'm currently on bed watching The Office trying to forget about it. I can't stop shaking. Who knows what he wanted and what his plan was. Thank God someone opened the door for me, because I have a strong gut feeling I would have never made it home. Two thousand two. I was 14 years old and starting freshman year. I was an awkward, nerdy girl that didn't know how to handle attention from boys, so you could say I had made things worse for my situation. I had a knack for making friends with the weird people that no one liked, but I tried to be friendly with everyone I met, so it wasn't a big deal for me. Clubs were a big deal and they actually had an anime club, so of course I was all about that. At the first club meeting, I sat next to a couple of friends and just soaked it all up. I thought I was finally with my people. Then here comes Stalker Kid. I'd use his real name, but to this day I have no idea what it is. He sat in front of me, and being that person, I said hi. I could tell he was a bit uncomfortable and didn't know anyone at the event, so I was just being nice. And boy, did this guy cling to me for that one word. At first, he would just find me during lunch and just stand there mumbling things to me. He had such a soft, high-pitched voice, a mousy little guy that you just felt unnerved when he spoke to you. And the way he would look at you as he spoke, I could never look him in the eyes. After a while, it became more asking about my personal life and what I was into. Me being dumb and naive, I tried to be friendly and chat while feeling a bit uncomfortable. After a while, my friends and I would move to different tables, benches, even hallways to avoid him, but he always somehow found me. After about a year of this, my best friend finally told me that if I didn't tell him to fuck off, he would. I really didn't want him around anymore, so, sure, go ahead. So one day during lunch, here comes the stalker kid with his signature greeting, barely above a whisper. My buddy just tells him, dude, she's not interested, go away. Looking hurt, he shuffles away. I thought he didn't have to be so hard at him, but I thanked him anyways. I didn't see him much around school after that except for club days where he would just sit across the room and stare at me while my best friend glared at him. Cut to me being 16 and driving now, minus the awkward club days, I didn't really notice anything from him. That is, until an old gray beat-up car started parking next to me extremely close. 
But one day after school, he was waiting for me in that car. He started asking me how I'd been, what about prom and all that stuff. I was trying to rack my brain on how he knew that was my car, unless he had been watching me before and after school. I started getting there later and leaving later to avoid him, because he was like clockwork. Finally, a boy I used to be friends with in elementary school was walking out with me and made a comment about how that guy was always next to my car and asked if he was my boyfriend. I immediately said no, and he's always following me around and that I hated it. It was really starting to freak me out. Bless this guy, because he walked right up to him and scared him off, threatening that if he ever parked near me again that he would kick his ass. I figured maybe that would be enough to keep him away. So again, there was a small space where I would hear nothing of him, except for my friends who had classes with him, telling me about how creepy he was. One friend had art class with him, and said he would draw nothing but naked women constantly in his books. What a classy guy. Junior year was wrapping up, and I started taking my BFF, Phil we'll call him, to and from school. He was on my way, so I figured why not. At some point, Phil started noticing that a little gray car was always heading the same way after school, and made a joke, thinking, what if a stalker kid lived next to him? What a small world, right? I could only be so lucky. One day, as per usual, the little gray car was following us, so we took a detour. Sure enough, he was with us every step of the way. It was no longer a joke. We both started freaking out. I pushed the gas pedal as hard as my foot could push it, and noped out of sight. I went home and told my mom everything, because at this point I knew this wasn't normal. She shoved it aside, saying I was probably seeing things. Well, it came time for our end-of-the-year club party. Of course, SK was a senior, so I would never have to see him again. For whatever stupid reason, I offered to host the party, thinking he hasn't gone to one yet, so let's celebrate this moment. I was terrified when my dad let him in the door. I don't remember ever giving him an invitation to the party. He spent the whole party talking to me and my dad, being all buddy-buddy with him, asking stuff about me and where my room was. I just wanted to cry and hide. It was all downhill after that. I remember there were days when I would hear a car pull up outside my front door, and my room having a window that saw the front. I would call my buddy Phil and peek to see if it was him. Three times in one month. I just hid under my desk and cried on the phone with Phil. Other events from school would be him asking a girl I played softball with the prom, only to dump her and follow me around all night. This includes to after the prom, where I never saw him in person. Our high school had a radio slash TV channel for kids to run, and during prom they would record us going up the stairs and playing around in the gym and after prom for the parents to see their kids having fun. Took one of my friends to point it out but it showed me playing DDR for a while against my friend Phil, and SK was standing right behind me, watching me for a good five minutes. I never even knew. The one that still creeps me out to this day is graduation for his class. Our classes were so big. They did a day and night ceremony, where all the students had to attend the day one. I was scanning the crowd to see my friends who were graduating when I saw a hand wave as I passed by. I looked back, and of course it was SK waving at me. How he had picked me out from a crowd of thousands, I'll never know. 2006. Senior year was great. No signs of the creepy SK to the point where I started to forget about him. I graduated and chose a college in town. I got a job at a local retail store and started to move on. Life was beginning to be normal. I work in the gaming department, so you get some weird randos every once in a while. One that I saw a lot was this little Mexican guy with glasses, who never purchased anything, but would just walk around from time to time. Then, SK comes strolling in the doors, and walks into gaming and just talks. 
I asked how he knew I worked here. He said his friend saw me and knew we were friends. I tried to radio for help over and over, for someone to come and get him out. Finally, a big guy from computers walks by and asks for my help in the back. Once he pulls me to safety, I tell him everything. From that point, security was aware and is told to watch out for this guy. Of course, he wasn't doing anything physical, so all they could do for me is to watch out for him. So every time he came in, they would walk me, and I would dip back to the warehouse. I started seeing his friend, who we called Ninja Friend, constantly and all he ever did was walk around on his phone. I began to suspect he was texting SK to tell him where I was, because sure enough, ten minutes later, he would come in too. So I tested this theory, and started to randomly walk around the store. At one point, a friend who worked the register asked why I would do this, so I had her take a walk with me on her break. I told her this NF would follow us everywhere, even just going down a random aisle. Sure enough, he did, and she began freaking out. A few minutes later, I told her my stalker would walk through the doors. Sure enough, I'm making my way to the warehouse, and out steps Ninja Fen from an aisle and says, She's right here! I just stared at him, like, who the hell do you think you are? SK walks up behind me and asks why I'm always running away from him. Oh, and he nosed my number and asks if I can give it to him again. I say, knowing damn good and well I never even gave it to him in the first place. Sure. I go to the warehouse and write, This is where I work. Don't ever come here again. And hand it to him. Clear out his friend. Walkie security about him and sit in the warehouse and break down. Security later tells me that he also cried when they took him out. And later that day as I'm leaving work, security offers to walk me to my car. This, of course, isn't the rules, but friends caring about friends. So I say, sure. SK is out by my car waiting for me. So this is where security says fuck it and calls the police, which we are conveniently next to their headquarters. He books it when he sees the car. A few years go by and nothing comes up. I buy a fancy new car and don't see him around that much. I'm thinking that did the trick and I'm finally free. My buddies and I are leaving work, ready to hit a night at the bar as per usual Thursday deal. We're all walking out the door, where we all have to stand and wait to hear the alarm sound to verify it's armed. As we're walking out, I hear it. That awful sound. Hey! I cringe and grab my friend's arm and turn. There he is, leaning on his car, waiting. My friend recognizes him and asks him what he wants. He says he just wants to talk to me. He didn't ever see my car, so he didn't think I worked here anymore. His other friend is sitting in the back seat of his car just staring at me blankly. I started to think the worst. If my friends leave me here, my gut tells me I'm not coming into work the next day, or ever. I'm terrified that he's had years of time to think about our last encounter, where I wrote my number down and made him cry. I grab my friend's arm tighter. My friend goes off, pretends to be my boyfriend, and rips into him. My friend is about two feet taller than him, and much, much bigger. They get into it, and I'm just standing in the parking lot. I'm a terrible person for this, but I'm sure you understand at this point. Thinking, kick his ass. He spooked SK so bad that I'm pretty sure he pissed himself, before getting back in his car and booking it. Ever since, if he comes into the store, my friend stares him down from his office, and he leaves. He's never bought anything in all these years. Years later, I've moved on and gotten married, and moved out of town. Recently, we moved back to start a business, and to this day, I still feel myself looking behind me at stores, just in case I randomly bump into him. He caused me to have anxiety, mental and emotional pain fear and trust issues for a decade. Even after moving on, I still feel the effects today, and I never even knew his name. I had an encounter in December of last year that left me feeling very unsettled. 
I was in a vulnerable position, as my partner and I, both female and homeless, had just purchased an RV to live in, but were having trouble finding a spot to rent because it was an older model and we had pets. We had parked in the farthest corner of the Walmart parking lot in Bend, Oregon at around 10 a.m. one day. My partner had errands that needed to be ran and took a bus to do such as I held down the fort and watched the dogs. It was going to be a long day of waiting around for her to get back so we could leave. I went into the store twice to make some purchases early in the day. I worked on some maintenance and art before getting bored enough to take a nap. As I was taking the dogs outside beforehand, two police officer vehicles pulled up and parked right next to the RV. At this point, I'm preparing for them to ask me to move the vehicle or tell me I can't park overnight or something. After a while of nothing, though, I fell asleep anyway. When I woke up, I could tell it was getting closer toward the evening. The sun was still very much up, and considering the police presence, I wasn't particularly in the mindset of anything bad happening. Still, I always carry my pepper spray on me. My partner was still not back yet, although I expected her late. She had our only phone, so I went into the store to check the time. The officers had moved already at this point, and the parking area in general was pretty barren, save for one van parked in the spot right behind the RV. I entered the store and went to the restroom in the front. Then I walked to the electronics department to see what time it was on the displays. It was a few minutes before 6 p.m. I left after only having been there a few minutes. As I was walking out the door... The crowd in front of me slowly dispersed to veer toward their respective vehicles. I continued walking behind one man, who had seemingly parked in the same direction as me. He was tall, thin, and scraggly, with shoulder-length blonde hair and a black hoodie. I walked maybe thirty feet behind him the whole way. As he passed all the cars by the front of the store, I came to the conclusion that he must be the owner of the van by my RV. He walked with clear direction, not looking around for where his car was or anything. After passing the main crowd of the parking lot, I got my pepper spray out of my pocket and held it in hand as a routine safety measure. The man walked between the back of the RV and the driver's side door of the van. I figured he was about to get in, but instead he lingered. Now, I stopped walking that direction and started heading toward a more populated parking area at the next store across the street, since it was closer than Walmart from this end. Then he looked at me, and we made eye contact for about a minute. It felt as if he recognized me, as if he'd been staking me out and was surprised to see me leaving the store so soon. I continued to walk away while staring at him, and he watched me before slipping around the side of my RV where there were some bushes and a fence with no outlet. I was noping out at this point, so I go into the other store and walk around blankly, staring at things for a bit, trying to formulate a plan. It's pretty busy in there with no one at the customer service desk, so I go into the gas station next door and ask to use the phone. I call my partner to explain the situation and tell her not to go directly to the RV. Then I headed back into Walmart got a coffee at the McDonald's inside and waited out for another hour until she was able to return. Perhaps I should have called the police, as I was worried about my animals. My little dog would bark, but they're not exactly guard dogs, and our possessions being stolen. But I had recently called 911 while witnessing domestic violence a few days prior, only to have them take two hours to show up in the middle of downtown. I was worried they would not only not help, but possibly harass me for parking there. I don't have a driver's license, so having to move the RV before my partner returned would be a dangerous situation. Once she arrived, we went back to the RV together. The van was gone. Nothing was touched, despite one of the windows not locking properly, but the pets were extremely spooked. Maybe they had decided against stealing after I caught them. 
and I'm not well off, and honestly, one look at that beat up old thing would tell you I don't have much worth taking. Honestly though, from the look in that guy's eyes, I feel like he wasn't after material possessions. I'm happy that I never have to find out for sure. I've reached out to the mods with evidence to verify this story. I just have to send them this link after posting, so it may take a little bit of time to get it verified. I'm noting this because I know this story sounds completely ridiculous, but the girl I experienced this with is actually insane. A lot of people may have heard about this girl. She was all over the news after she stalked a guy bombarded him with 65,000 texts, and broke into his house all over one date. We met shortly after she went on that date with him, and we were friends for a while before she broke into his house. At first, she seemed like a nice, albeit somewhat quirky, person. I met her when I spent a couple of months visiting the west coast of the U.S. in the summer of 2017. And I thought she was cute and we spent a lot of time together. We were living next door to each other for a few weeks, and we were never really more than friends. I stopped having any sort of non-platonic feelings after she started to talk a lot about a guy she had met on some dating website. Apparently, he was her soulmate, and she had somehow been guided to him by following her birth calendar. I would only later come to know that they had only been on one date, and he had never spoken to her again. I thought that was weird, but I enjoyed our conversations for the most part, and she was funny and nice, so we remained friends. Eventually, she moved on to short flings with a guy and then another girl from Tinder, all the while still talking to me about this guy that she was going to marry, saying that she liked how jealous he got when she would tell him about hooking up with other people. A couple of weeks later, she started to get really erratic. I confronted her a few times about how she was acting, and she told me that she had recently stopped taking her meds, but would start taking them again. She came home one day and decided to tell me that she had a court date coming up for a DUI. I have no idea if this is actually true, but if there's a way to find that out, it happened in Arizona and her name is pretty easy to find. Someone could look it up if they wanted to know, I guess. Her plan was actually to leave the country and go to South America. I told her what a dumb idea that was. And even though she actually went all the way to the airport in a different city, she wound up coming back. Apparently, her soulmate was no longer answering her texts, and she took that as a sign she should drag her ass back to where he was and fix their relationship. She was upset that he may be seeing other people, even though it seemed okay to her that she was doing the same thing. Later on, she told me she had texted him and said if he blocked her, she would know that meant he wanted her to come find him. Obviously, he blocked her. Obviously, that didn't go over well with her. So she moved a couple of days later, and the summer was ending, and I moved back to the East Coast. I didn't hear from her for a little while, but then we started talking again through text and WhatsApp. She generally seemed like she was doing better. She told me she had found a roommate and was working on her art again and just generally seemed like she was in a better place. I was happy to have my friend back and healthy, but that didn't last longer than a couple of months. Eventually her behavior started to become erratic again. She was sending dozens of texts at a time and they were all over the place. Several of them had to do with her soulmate, and how she was still following him even though he had called the police and blocked her. I told her to stop, tried to get her to take her meds, I tried to reason with her different ways a hundred times. I was on the opposite side of the country, and I had no way of getting in touch with her family, who I never knew much about, or her friends to try and get them to help her. She was a kind person and a good friend when she was taking care of her mental health, and I cared about her, but I couldn't force her to take care of herself. One day, I set aside some time to call her, and I told her that she was overwhelming me, 
and that she really needed to reach out to her family or someone who could help her. She told me I couldn't do that, because she needed to stay with me, or she would have to go back to her ex-husband. I don't think any of this is true, but she thought her ex-husband was going to have her killed or followed, that he had the entire police force in his pocket, that he had paid off her family to give him intel on her whereabouts and what was going on in her life. I had just moved for a job, and I lived in a small studio in a big city. I had no room for anyone to stay long term, and I wasn't about to do that anyways, and she was starting to scare me at this point. She asked if I was still living at this address, which really freaked me out, because I had never given her my address in the first place, or put it anywhere online. She wouldn't tell me how she got it. I asked her to leave me alone, and told her we couldn't be friends anymore unless she took some steps to get better. Obviously, she didn't take this well. Though I hated my tiny, cramped apartment, the reason I was drawn to it was because it had great security. It was actually on the upper floors of a hotel, although the hotel rooms were much nicer than the residence, and no one was allowed through the residence elevators unless the resident had given their name to security ahead of time, and the guest had to show ID. After what happened next, I loved my cramped little apartment because the staff kept me safe. It had been over a week since I had talked to her because I blocked her number and blocked her on WhatsApp. She tried texting me from four different phone numbers, but I just blocked them all and never responded. I was walking home from work one day, and I was sure I saw her across the street from my building. It was storming out, and I didn't get a good view. I rushed upstairs and calmed myself down in my apartment. Maybe I was just being paranoid. It's a big city. Lots of people have brown hair and glasses. I was just worried about her. But then the phone rang. The desk was calling to see if I had forgotten to let them know I had a visitor. My heart sank. I asked them who was waiting. They said they tried asking for her name or ID, but she just walked out right away. I knew it was her from the way they described her. I texted a mutual friend from over the summer. I wasn't really close with him, so we hadn't stayed in touch but he told me she had lost it, and that he had blocked her too. Apparently, she had gone back on the dating site she met her soulmate on, and found someone who looked just like him in my city. She was convinced it was him, and had come here to find him. This was a very touristy city, but there was just no way this guy had coincidentally come out here. I was sure she had gone bonkers, and I knew she was well aware of where that guy actually lived. I took the page out of her book and used a text-free number to text her that she should leave me alone and I would call the cops if she ever came near my building or me again. In retrospect, I shouldn't have contacted her at all, but I was emotional and not using my better judgment. She said she just wanted to know if I could help her find something, texted back really fast and didn't even try to hide it. Then I deleted the app so she couldn't reach me again. I lived in a very crowded area, and I knew she couldn't get into my building, but I was still scared whenever I had to take public transit alone at night, was walking through less crowded areas to get home. I had a friend who used to work for the police, not in this city or at the time this all happened, and she would drive or walk me home from work whenever she could for a while. She told me I should go ahead and report it, even though they couldn't really do anything since she hadn't heard me, and nothing had really happened. I was embarrassed, and again, didn't use my better judgment. I felt like it was my fault for engaging with her for so long. I knew she was mentally unstable, and I would still try to be her friend and help her. Maybe I gave her the wrong idea that I could do more for her. I ended up moving to a new city for another job after that, and I didn't hear from her again. I later found out the reason why was that a couple months later she had once again gone back to Arizona and had been arrested for breaking into her soulmate's house and using his bathtub. They found a large knife in her car. I didn't want to go into too much detail about her stalking of that guy and what she said about him in our text because I wanted to try and focus on my personal experience instead of just her with his.
so this happened over a year ago. Our oldest son, Caden, was three at the time, and our youngest son, Connor, was around five months old. It still gives me chills. It still makes me uncomfortable even walking by. It was a January evening in Pennsylvania. It was dark outside with a couple of inches of snow on the ground. We had just finished eating dinner, and I planned on giving our little one a bath. My husband drives a truck for work, so he isn't home very often. It's just me and the boys during the week. Caden was playing in his toy room that has a door leading to the side deck. A little detail. We have no sensor light or even a porch light on that whole side of the house. At this time, we didn't use the deck at all, only using our grill during the summer months. It's not even close to the sidewalk or the next street over. Basically an open space of yard off that deck. Anyway, Caden was playing in the toy room, waiting for his turn to take a bath while I brought Connor into the bathroom. We were just about done with bath time when I hear Caden's little feet running toward the bathroom. He stands in the doorway and says, Mommy, there's a man looking in the side door. I think it's the mailman. My heart skipped a beat. No way was the mailman coming at 7 p.m. And the side door, as he called it, was basically never used, especially not in the winter. I didn't even hear anyone knock. I began to sketch myself out more by thinking about how there was no light on the deck and this person would have to walk through the yard in the snow, walk up the back stairs of the deck, and go to that door when the front porch light was on and attached to a shoveled sidewalk. I took Connor out of the bath, put him in a towel in his little chair, and told Caden to sit with his brother and not come out until I said it was okay. He was confused, but listened. He just kept asking what was wrong. I grabbed the biggest kitchen knife I could find. I had 911 ready to call and got my mama bear face on. When I walked to the side door, I shined the flashlight on my phone through the window of the door at a distance, walking up to it to hopefully scare someone away. It was mostly made out of glass. The worst thought with this as a mother is that as I reached for the handle, I realized that the door was unlocked. The man could have walked right in. I flung the door open, shined my light, held up my knife, and yelled, Hey! in the most threatening voice a 5'4", 120-pound woman could make. There were footprints in the snow up the deck stairs and back down, going into the field and the woods behind our house. I slammed the door thoroughly freaked out and locked it up tight. I called the police and waited in the bathroom with the boys. While I was in there, I asked Caden, Do you know who the man was? He said, No, but he smiled and waved at me for a really long time. I asked him what the man was wearing. He told me that he had on a hat that looked like a mailman's and that he wasn't wearing a coat. That's all I managed to get out of him. The police officer came and searched the property with flashlights before finally coming inside. He asked me and Caden some questions, and then informed me that he not only saw footprints leading up to the side deck, but also to the outside door to our basement and kitchen window on the other side of the house as well. He suggested that I have someone come and stay with us for the night, and that we continue to follow the footprints that were left in the snow back to the field and wood line. My father-in-law slept on the couch that night with his gun. Being the closest relative to our house, my mother was a nervous wreck, and I got very little sleep that night. I never heard back from the police. I'm guessing the tracks were lost through the bit of woods. Caden still mentions it from time to time randomly, and we got a blackout curtain for that door. I'd still very much like to get better locks just to be safe. My husband and my father think it might have been a man who saw me home alone while passing, and hopefully wanted to sneak a peek. But why just stand and watch my child, and go around the whole back of the house, not by the front door or street? I hope never to see that creep's face, and I hope he never smiles or waves at my child again.
This happened a long time ago, when I was around 15 or so. I'm 25 now. Back then, I was really into singing and dancing with my friends, and I was introduced to K-pop as a result. This was way before K-pop became noticeably mainstream, so whenever events relating to it came up, we got very excited. There was a global audition for one of the big companies in my town, and my three friends and I decided to go. I was the only non-Asian girl in our friend group. I'm only mentioning it because it pertains to the story later. The K-pop fandom back then was pretty much the same as it is now. People of various ethnicities were into the idol music genre. We all knew the likelihood of getting into the industry was extremely low, and for me even more so as I wasn't of Asian descent, but I knew that going in. That wasn't the point of us going, though. We just loved being in proximity of something important to the genre we enjoyed. Just some kids having fun. By the way, I looked pretty young for my age then, and wearing pigtails this day probably didn't help with that either. So we get dropped off and meet up at the addition place, a community center of some sort. We kind of dilly-dally around a bit, until we have to line up for our respective auditions. Singing, dancing, the like. I was going to go sing, so I was mentally preparing myself in the crowded space outside of the audition rooms. That's when out of the corner of my eye, I see a tall, older, forties maybe, white man begin to approach me. I remember thinking, huh, is he going to audition too or something? It was strange because everyone else there was younger. Maybe he was one of their parents. He walks up to me pretty close and goes, Can you help me, please? I'm confused and ask what he needs help with. Oh, the staff here. My son. My son's trying to audition, but they won't let him. This was weird. When I asked him why, he said, Because he's not Korean. This was when I started to get creeped out. I looked around to see an extremely diverse crowd, and then back at him. I, I don't know. That's terrible. You should talk to, and then I point towards the staff. They should be able to help. I knew he was bullshitting, but I was too scared to say anything else. He didn't listen, and continued to insist on me helping him. He then said something that sent a chill down my spine. When I was trying for the fifth time to convince him to approach the staff instead of me, he beckoned me to come outside with him. My son's just outside in my car. Can you come talk to him, please? That was when I repeated what I said earlier. It began to firmly walk in the opposite direction. He kept trying to coax me out to see his son. I managed to finally lose him in the crowd of people. Only seconds later, I see him talking to my friend about me and helping his son and all that. I was shocked. The man had clearly been watching me for a while to know who I came with. We had all split up by that point. I went up immediately and told her we should get going, without even looking at the man. He ignored me and kept on speaking to her. Without speaking, I went up to her, grabbed her hand and pulled her at once to get away from him. She was super gullible and didn't understand why I was so worried. The man was clearly unnerved by what I did and left my friend and disappeared into the crowd. About 20 minutes later, I'm in the lineup for the audition, when I get a cold feeling all over my body. I turn to look toward the entrance, and there he was, standing. But he wasn't just standing. He had his arms crossed, and he was glaring at me. I've never seen someone look at me with such vitriol. He looked like he wanted to genuinely kill me. It was terrifying. The crowd of people was sparse because we had all lined up outside our assigned rooms. This man waited there, staring at me non-stop for an hour. An hour! He glared at me all the way until I got into the audition room. I was so scared that he'd be there once I got out. But I guess the auditions went on longer than he expected. And he went home. With his son in tow, I'm guessing.
This is a story from a few years back, when I was in my last year of college. I was taking a history class that I loved, and it just so happened that my good friend Amelia was in the class too. Of course we sat right next to one another. The class was taught by a very popular professor, so there were a good deal of people in it. At the time I was a smoker, as was my friend Amelia, so we made a habit of sharing cigarettes together after class. Around this time, I started to befriend another person, Rachel. She and I didn't take any classes together, but she lived with another good friend of mine, so we started to get to know one another. Rachel and I would do homework together, hang out outside of the library together on study breaks, and so on. Amelia met Rachel separately, and before long, the three of us became a little trio. About a month after we all became friends with Rachel, this boy from Amelia and I's class started to say hello to us during our cigarette break. He would make little comments here and there about things we learned in class, and would ask us how we were doing our papers and such. Eventually, we learned his name was Ryan, and Ryan became a fixture in our cigarette ritual. After a little while, Amelia and I noticed that Ryan was asking a lot of questions about our daily schedules. At first, we thought he was just trying to get to know us and our interests, but his questions were getting specific. What time did we go to the library? When did we study in places other than the library? Who did we like to study with? He was his normal smiley and friendly self the whole time, but the subject matter of his questions were just off. We thought perhaps he was a bit socially awkward. A lot of people at our school, well known for being full of eccentric students, were well eccentric. It wasn't terribly uncommon to encounter somebody who acted a little bit different than the norm. We let it slide. Ryan started asking Amelia and I to hang out outside of class. He wanted to tag along in what we usually did, but Amelia and I were both unusually busy at the time, and it kept not working out with our schedules. He kept asking every day after class, though, and we noticed he was getting less happy and significantly more irritated as time continued to go on. Amelia and I both agreed that he was starting to make us uncomfortable, though we couldn't quite put our fingers on why. One day, Rachel met Amelia and I at her dormitory, saying she had something serious she needed to speak with us about. When we got there, we settled onto a bench and got talking. Rachel told us that she had recently gotten out of a terrible abusive relationship with a boy who hit her, sexually assaulted her, and took general pleasure in her misery. Around the time we had met Rachel, she had begun the process of reporting him to campus authorities in an attempt to have him removed from campus. A temporary no-contact order had been put into place between the two of them, and Rachel told us that she had just moved into the dorm she was living in so that he wouldn't know where she lived. She had also found out that her ex was attempting to befriend the people she knew in an attempt to find out where she was living, where she spent her time, and what she liked to do and when. She wanted to warn us just in case he approached us, so that we would keep our distance and not reveal any information about her routines. She told us his name. His name was Ryan. Amelia and I both looked at each other in shock. To confirm, we asked Rachel to describe what he looked like, and she described our new cigarette buddy and classmate to a T. We immediately informed Rachel about the interactions we had been having with Ryan, and Rachel informed us that we were the fifth and sixth people she had confirmed that Ryan was attempting to make contact with. Of course, we immediately started avoiding him, switching up our routines to make sure we left the area immediately after class ended. A few weeks later, Ryan stopped showing up to class. Neither of us ever saw him again. A few weeks after that, Rachel informed Amelia and I that Ryan had been expelled from the school. He had sexually assaulted another student at a party. When they went to collect evidence from his dorm room, they found a detailed ledger of information he had collected about Rachel and pieces of writing about all of the horrendous things he wanted to do to her. I'm not entirely sure whatever happened to him, but thank God we never saw him again. So this happened around four or five years ago, when I was in high school as a freshman when I was 14. A little context. When I started high school, I was very shy and introverted, 
but somehow ended up becoming really close friends with the prettiest and most popular girls at school. So these three girls were all used to being the center of attention, and it didn't bother them. It was about the end of December, and our exams for the semester were finally over that day. To celebrate, us four decided to go to the nearby mall and see a movie. It was the first time we had all gone out together, instead of hanging out at school, so we were very excited. Even I ended up dressing up and putting on makeup. We get our tickets. We are laughing, we're having fun when one of the girls suggests that we go and get snacks from the market inside the mall because it's much cheaper than the ones that are at the movie theater. It makes sense. So we went three or four floors down to buy some gummy bears and whatnot. Now the thing is, I have anxiety and a very strong instinct, but when you have both, people usually don't tend to believe you and say it's the result of your anxiety. When we entered the big market, I immediately felt that something was wrong. I ignored it, for I didn't want to ruin our first proper night out. The girls headed towards the drinks first, and that's when I noticed them, in the drink aisle. There were these two guys looking at us while talking and laughing. All while doing that, and the time it took for me and my friends to pick up the drinks, they never once broke their stare, nudging and whispering to each other. One of them was well over six feet and seemed pretty strong. The other was blonde. He was shorter but he was still taller than the three of us. I was uncomfortable with their stares, but I just figured it's men being disgusting perverts, and I urged my friends to move on. When we moved to the next aisle, I saw them again not a minute after us. They stood at one end while we were at the other, still looking straight at us, their whispering now seemingly more heated. I grew really anxious at that, and quietly pulled one of the girls aside and told her, that I thought these dudes were following us. My friend says, we're four pretty girls. It's normal for guys to look at us. You're just being paranoid. She flipped her blonde hair while saying that, leaving me behind and moving to the next aisle. I had no intention of being left alone with those guys, so I followed after them very quickly. We went two aisles over, and each time they followed us. Whenever I tried to see what they were doing discreetly, their gazes would be upon us. The smaller blonde had one of the creepiest grins on his face that didn't quite reach his eyes. The tall one was smiling, but I can't forget the fact that he kept licking his lips. I was growing more and more anxious at this point, but the final straw was when we moved to the register to pay for our things. They came to the register right across from us. When I looked up, the blonde one winked at me, still with that smug grin plastered on his face. The friend that I talked to a little earlier saw it as well. I think you're right. They are following us, she whispered into my ear, and we told the other girls this as well. It was about 9 p.m. at this point, and our movie would start in half an hour, so the floor we were on was getting less crowded with each minute. There was a cosmetic shop right across from the register that we were at. We decided to go there because A, it was the closest place and B, guys wouldn't go into the small cosmetics shop. We bagged our items, paid, and dashed into the store before the guys could move. Hoping that they would leave us alone now, we waited and pretended to look at some nail polishes. Instead of leaving like we thought they would, they started pacing in front of the store, waiting for us to come out. We thought about getting the store manager to call them all security, but we knew that the security here sucked, so we didn't call them. The four of us stayed there waiting to see if they would leave, but they didn't. They just kept pacing left and right, looking at us. The way the mall is designed, when you get out of the shop where you are, you can either go left or right. If you went left, you'd walk into a long hall, take another left, and there would be the escalator. If you took a right though, there were only bathrooms at the end of a hall, and it was pretty empty and dark. If those guys got us there, I knew that that would be it. So we decided to make a run for it. When the men passed the store for what felt like the millionth time, we took off running towards the escalators. I dared to look back and saw the two guys behind, not running like we were, but following us fastly. Had it not been for the fact that we had to run up the four stairs and lose these guys as fast as we could, I would start sobbing right then and there. After that, I didn't dare look behind me, 
and we just kept running until we got to the doors of the movie theater and threw ourselves in. There was a security guard there, so we told him everything. We gave descriptions in case they figured where we went and waited. They didn't come after us, though. Maybe we lost them. Maybe they decided that the trouble wasn't worth it. As the sense of safety kicked in and the adrenaline left, I had such a panic attack that I don't even remember the movie that I was excited to see. When the movie was over, we peeked our heads out. But fortunately, the guys were gone. We went home and never had to deal with them again. So this was perhaps the strangest day I'd ever experienced. It is honestly so surreal and bizarre that I really don't know how else to talk about it. I was 12 at the time, which was six years ago, and was going school supply shopping with a friend before the start of eighth grade. I had to take the subway to her house, and my parents didn't actually let me take the subway since it was quite a bit more dangerous than it is now, though I insisted on it, and my parents finally let me go. I was always really aware on the subway, and this was all before the Me Too movement, and at 12.13, I had already been preyed on by various sexual predators on the subway, i.e. men grabbing my thighs, lifting up my skirts. I thought I could handle them, although they did scare me a lot, so I had to transfer to this above-ground station, and as I was standing there, minding my own business, I noticed a man down the station who was harassing women in perhaps the most unusual way I've ever seen. He was wearing Valentine's boxers, a wife beater that was stained yellow with sweat, and a massive styrofoam cowboy hat. He had a massive handlebar mustache, and kind of looked like Eggman from Sonic. He had a giant pillow, shaped like a salmon, with a salmon design printed on it. He had this all held up with guitar straps, he was chasing women down the platform by spitting on them, or clicking at them as a cowboy would do to a horse. I froze up and was absolutely terrified, though also in a bit of awe. Who was this guy? My train came and I realized that I had to walk past him to get onto it. I walked slowly and tried my best not to make eye contact with him, though the clicking began, and I found myself running as fast as I could until I jumped onto the train. I found a seat, but realized that he had gotten on as well. Fortunately, the train was very crowded, and he got a bit distracted, clicking at not underage women. I don't remember exactly what happened, as I think I was in a bit of shock. But some kind of fight broke out after some guy stole his styrofoam cowboy hat and started tearing it apart. I got off the next stop and just decided to walk. I arrived at my friend's house, and we hung out for a while. I told her about Mr. Salmon, as I like to call him. We watched Green Day videos, normal 12, 13-year-old stuff. We both got out the money from our parents, and buy some other random stuff like ice cream and makeup before we head out to the nearest Staples. The nearest Staples was in a Jewish neighborhood, and they certainly do not like outsiders. We were getting all sorts of looks in the store as we were the only non hazardate kids there. We were both wearing t-shirts and shorts, and they did not all seem pleased by that. We got our stuff, although it was grossly overcharged by the hazardate cashier, who was giving us evil glares, and then decided to go to some kind of bakery, since we were hungry. We walked into this bakery and asked for two muffins. Immediately they asked us if we were Jewish. I'm literally just one-eighth Jewish. But my friend was Jewish, and was prepping for her bar mitzvah. So she said yes quietly, and I said no, since I'm literally not. I'm blonde, blue-eyed, and gangly at the time. After about 10 minutes, they handed her her muffin. We had to wait 45 minutes before they gave me my muffin, which immediately smelled kind of weird. Before I could bite into it, a hazardic grown man sat down at our table and told us that unless we were Jewish, we shouldn't be here. And when my friend said she was Jewish, he told her how she was sinning by looking like that. He finally left and I took a bite of my muffin, only to find out that it had been filled with meat. We left shortly after that. Wow.
This story happened to me when I was in the fifth grade, so about 15 years ago, when I was about 9 or 10. As a disclaimer, I'm not good at confrontations, and some pretty stupid decisions were made. It was Christmas Eve. We were getting ready to go across the street to my grandmother's house for dinner and presents. My mom was in charge of the dessert, which only needed to be drizzled with some sort of sweet sauce from a can. We didn't have this last ingredient, so my mom asked me to go to the store to get one. This was in Mexico, where people can quite literally open up little miscellaneous stores in their homes, slap a name on it, and you had an establishment. So I walked to the store, which was located on the same spot where my house was, but on the street behind it. There was a tree in my backyard from where I could see the two-story house that doubled as the store. So to get there I had to walk to the corner, turn left, go to the next corner, and turn left again. On the street perpendicular to both my street and the stores, there was a house with a lot of vegetation on its front lawn. We used to call it the jungle. It had a tall concrete fence and a wooden door, so you couldn't actually see the house, only the outside and a bunch of greenery in the yard. On my way back home, I was daydreaming, and I didn't notice this drunk, homeless-looking oldish man in his fifties standing by the wooden door that leads to the jungle. I looked up about three meters before I would have quite literally run into him, and I sort of yelped, a little because he scared me. He was looking at me and smiling, slightly swaying. He says, Hi. Hello. How are you doing? I'm okay. Nice to meet you. Then he puts his hand out for a handshake. And I actually shake his hand. After this creep shakes my hand, I try to pull it back. But he wouldn't let it go. By now he's pretty close to me, asking me if I wanted to come with him. I'm freaking out, so I don't really remember exactly what he said. I was trying to look for an excuse to get home. And I told him I did not want to go with him. But my dad would get mad and go look for me if I didn't go home immediately. He agreed, told me to ask my dad for permission to go with him and let me go. I speed walked back home, scared that he would change his mind and follow me. When I got home, I left the can of whatever sauce I bought on the table and headed straight to my room. My mom asked me what was wrong because I was pretty shaken up, but I was scared of telling her and I just went to my room. My dad then walked in, I suppose because my mom asked him to, to find out what happened, and I told him everything. My mom was by the door, so she heard it all, and I swear I had never seen my mom so furious. She went to the kitchen, grabbed a knife, and put it in the front pocket of the sweater she was wearing. She told me to walk to the exact spot where it happened, and that they were going to walk behind me out of sight, I guess to catch the guy. I remember being really scared walking by myself again, but knowing my parents were behind me made it a little better, but the guy wasn't there. We walked around to try and find out where he had gone, but we were never able to find him, and we went back home. Honestly, I don't know what my parents would have done if we had found him anyway. Apparently, the description I gave my parents matched a pretty well-known addict that lived by and roamed the neighborhood. Years later, I heard that he had died of an overdose which made me less paranoid when leaving my house, at least until we moved. I can still remember it like it was yesterday. My mother's words clinging to my eardrums, like plastic wrap on the leftover's plate. I need you and your friends to be extra careful there have been reports of a white truck following little girls home. If you see your friends walking alone, don't let them. You walk with them until they get there, and do not leave them until they reach their front door. To ease her worry, I began walking with everyone to school and back home. It took me longer to get home, but I had the safest location on my street. At that time, my house could see into all surrounding parks and school playgrounds, and sat at the top of a hill. It was next door to both the mayor of the housing authority and the sergeant first class of the military police. 
In my mother's defense, she was a single mom of four and was active duty. I didn't have the luxury of getting rides to school when typically she was out of the home at 5 a.m. and didn't return until 5 p.m., even in the summer. School started at 8 a.m. and ended at 3 p.m., and you could only take the bus to school if you lived more than three miles from the campus. In case you didn't know, the military is a full-time job, regardless of your home situation or your kids. When you get orders, you follow them or risk demotions or being dishonorably discharged. I did the same routine every day. Go across the street, through the two houses, down the sidewalk. Go through an alleyway until I reached the tank destroyer trail. Walk half a mile to the concrete bridge that goes over to the street, and finally down the other side to the school's side doors. Reverse order, repeat every year for three years. My mother was a drill sergeant, and until that morning I had never really taken her words seriously. I remember telling her, we live on a military base, mom. There's no way I'm going to go missing, and besides, I'll scream. It's summer in central Texas. It's a blistering hot day, and summer school has been dismissed early. A few friends of mine and me were walking home together, but today is eerily quiet between us. My gut is buzzing like an angry hive the further away we get from the school. For whatever reason, I felt like I was being watched. I do a scan of the area and notice that there are no other students around but myself, Aubrey, Ashley, and Amber. Nothing is being said as we get halfway across the bridge, so I break the silence and ask if they're okay. Ashley responds, My mom and dad have been warning me about this truck that's been following kids home. Aubrey chimes in too. Mine too. I think they're just trying to scare us. But why? What purpose would serve them to do that? Maybe to keep tabs on us? Aubrey replied while looking at her phone. Aubrey's dad was a bit of a control freak, but I doubt that even he would have done something that drastic to control her. If that was the case, then there would be no reason for all of our parents to warn us. Well, I'm going to go home this way today, Ashley says as she started taking a different route home. But what about the truck? Amber grabs Ashley's hand and grips it tightly. You need to stay with us. I look over at Aubrey, who's walking a bit faster down the trail. I can hear the fear in her voice. I'm getting out of here before something bad happens. My hair practically jumps off of my body hearing her say those words. All of my danger bells and whistles are going off so loudly that I can barely hear myself talk. Ashley, at least let us walk you there. I pleaded. She reluctantly agrees and comes back to the trail with us. Aubrey is a good length ahead of us and so we yell for her to slow down. She turns around and I can see the whites of her eyes. I turn just slightly to my right, and from the corner of my eye, there's an all-white truck, no license plate, and a tinted front window, so you couldn't see the driver. It was slowly driving by the curb on the main road, and it was definitely following us. There were no other cars around, and that made it all the more creepy. I stopped walking and looked straight at the truck. I tried to see if I could make out any distinctive marks, a make or a model, but it didn't even seem to have a brand on it. Ford, Chevy, Nissan, no grill emblem at all. My friends stopped and then we all stared. Whoever was in that driver's seat was certainly looking back at us. All of us held our breaths and waited for it to leave, but it didn't. My every sense was telling me to run. My fight or flight was only flight at that point. I already knew it was going to come next. I placed my leg behind me and as I took a step back, it's going to chase us, we need to run. Before the others could respond, the engine of the truck roared like a lion. The front tires jumped to the curb and the truck came barely down the trail. That half a mile seemed to take forever to run down. We bolted down the trail as fast as we could and it was definitely gaining on us. We get to the end of the trail and stopped at the sidewalk that's by the neighborhood street. It was still chasing us. We all shouted and screamed. Aubrey tried to grab her cell phone and dial 911, but dropped it as we were running. Where was everyone? How was no one hearing us cry out? Behind all these houses, whose backyards led to the walking trail? How was that even possible? Is no one seeing this? How can no one hear us? I tell them all to follow me to my house, and we finally get there. My front door is locked and I don't have my house key. 
We immediately go next door to the MP officer's house and begin hurling our fists at the door, screaming for help. The officer isn't home, but his wife is. She opens the door and we frantically get inside. We force her out of the way as we all run inside and slam the door shut. Miss Janet is asking us all kinds of questions, but we tell her to be quiet. We don't even make it to the couch. We all stand by the door and try to stay away from the windows. We hear the truck drive by and decide no one is leaving until Miss Janet's husband comes home. Just thinking about it as I'm telling the story makes my stomach hurt. It makes my mouth dry out and my neck stings as if hot needles are being forced down my esophagus. When he comes home, he makes a formal police report, tells our parents and our teachers and other students about the incident, but we never heard any updates of the truck. From then on, teachers were on every post of the trail for kids walking home from school. Military police were, and still are, posted on every corner within a two-mile radius of the school. It was my junior year of high school, and I was new. Most people were very friendly, and honestly, regardless of this negative experience I had, I still think it was the best school I ever went to. I ended up hanging out with the skateboarders. Most of them were decent enough guys. We always had a great time listening to music and hitting up our local McDonald's after school. One of my best friends, Matt, had a twin brother named Will. Will, for some reason, didn't like me at all and was always rude to me. I tried asking Matt one time why Will hated me so much and he just said something along the lines of, that's just how he is. Whatever, it wasn't my problem, and I never did anything to cause it, so I let it go. During the next school year, I met a guy named Jesse. Jesse was odd, but he seemed harmless enough, so I wasn't too worried in the beginning. We rarely talked, and were mostly just acquaintances, until one day, he came up to me in the hallway, handed me a note, and walked away. I was confused, but headed to my class before I got a chance to read the note. When I got settled in at my desk, I opened the note. It was mostly nonsensical. He said things like, I want to watch you get into arguments with your mom. You're really pretty. I think we'd be good together. And the strangest one, I want to watch you play Uno by yourself. It wasn't until the end that I felt the wave of chills through my body. The last one said, I want to watch you in your room from outside your window. He ended the note with his signature and his phone number. No way, this had to be a joke. No one would write something so weird and be serious. I let it go, and my friends reassured me that he was just kind of weird. Will made fun of me for it. He found it hilarious. Jesse began showing up around my locker. It started out small, with him just being there one period. Then it turned into every period. Every time I was there, he popped up somewhere in the hall. Our lockers were on separate sides of the school. We had no classes together. And there was really no reason why he would be showing up all the time. But he always made his presence known somehow. Sometimes I would feel somebody watching me and look around to see him somewhere in the hall. Sometimes just standing there staring at me. I absolutely hate being stared at. It makes me uncomfortable. There's no particular reason. It's just always bothered me. I just tried to ignore him and assumed it was part of his weird crush that he had on me. Until he followed me home one day. He didn't talk to me. Just watched me walk to my house, which was down the street from school. He stood across the street until I walked inside. Then he went back to the school to get home, wherever that was. I knew he never went that way and was thoroughly creeped out. I never told anyone, but I knew that he was aware of where my house was now. Was he going to show up? Would he watch me outside my window like he wanted to? I never saw him near my house again, but I was still freaked out. A couple of weeks later, I found a picture in my locker. It was hand-drawn and signed with Jesse's signature. The picture was creepy, 
with an angry looking snowman full of stab wounds that bled into a pile around the bottom of it. I was really freaked out, but again I let it go. I wasn't sure what I could even do. Thinking back I should have told a teacher or the principal, but I wasn't the type to make waves and assumed that he was just playing some kind of weird, sick joke. I showed my friends again, and they said it was creepy. They asked me if I wanted them to talk to Jesse for me, but I declined, again not wanting problems. After all, I was new at the school. But Will didn't make fun of me this time, though. He looked angry when he saw it, but never said anything to me about it. After a couple more weeks, during study hall, I asked my teacher if I could go to the hall to read since it was too distracting with other kids talking. He let me go and I headed out. Will was sitting against the lockers, also wanting to get away from the noise. He looked up at me, then back down to his book. Typical Will. I sat a few lockers down and got comfortable to start reading my book. From down the hall I heard footsteps coming our way. I didn't look up since it's a pretty high traffic area because the bathrooms are close by. The footsteps stopped right in front of me, and I looked up to see Jesse looking down at me with a smile on his face and a folded up piece of paper in his hand. He leaned down and gave it to me. When I opened it, I was immediately upset all over again. There was another drawing, this time a Care Bear with a butcher knife in one hand and his heart in the other and a huge bloody hole in his chest. I looked up at Jesse and he just smiled down at me in the most sinister way. I didn't know what to say, but I didn't have to. Will saw the picture and how upset I was. He stood up and walked over to Jesse, grabbed him by the shirt and slammed him against the lockers. Leave her alone and don't ever talk to her again or I'll beat the life out of you, Will told Jesse. I was completely dumbfounded. Will hated me. He never said one nice thing to me. Jesse was equally surprised by the reaction, as he barely knew Will. He mumbled something and walked away. But he never bothered me again, but still occasionally showed up around me at my locker. We never spoke after that, though. I didn't get any more interesting notes or pictures, and he never followed me home again. I was thankful to the rudest person I knew for standing up for me and stepping in when I felt that I couldn't. I have grown into my own, having no problem standing up for myself, but I am still thankful to Will for what he did. I never got to tell him, but I think he knew. In spring of 2015, I barely 18, took five of my friends, all girls, to what's known as Bunny Man Bridge in Fairfax, Virginia, since they'd never been. It was a Monday, maybe 9 p.m., and when we showed up, I wanted to get out and climb up along the railroad tracks that run over the bridge, as I had plenty of times in the past. I pulled the keys out of the ignition and sat for a minute telling them the tale of the Bunny Man at which point they got kind of freaked out and decided to stay in the car. We sat there and kept talking for maybe five minutes, until someone in the back seat gasped and froze staring out the back window on my driver's side of the car. I turned to my right to look at her and saw everyone else's faces freeze in horror, and the girl right behind me yelped. As I realized what was happening, I turned my head the other way to see who must be approaching. Someone started pounding on the back window and continued as they moved up towards my door. I turned just in time to see a man with a huge white dog come up and rip my door open. It was still unlocked from before when I'd been planning to get out. And for a second he just stood and stared at me and he was visibly enraged. He started telling me this was private property and we were trespassing and before I had a chance to tell him that we would leave. He started yelling at me to get out of the car. I said, we can just leave, you're being crazy. And at that point, he lost it and started really yelling right in my ear. And I think he saw my keys sitting on my lap because he tried to grab towards them. 
but I pushed his arm away and started yelling some profanities while my friend in the passenger seat gasped loudly. He stepped back for a second to look me up and down, and then started eyeing the big metal cop flashlight I keep wedged under my seat. He tried to grab that too, but luckily his dog was off doing its own thing, and the leash pulled his arm away long enough for me to grab the door handle. He caught it just before it shut, and was trying to force it back open, saying he was going to call the police. And I finally thought to grab my car keys with my free hand, and start the car. And I drove it off while he was still holding the handle, and then closed it once he couldn't keep up, and had to let go. I watched him in the mirror as we sped away, and it really freaked me out to see that he let go of his dog's leash, and began sprinting after us until he knew he couldn't catch up at which point he just let out this deep scream. And just as we passed back under the bridge, it looked like he was bending down to pick something up. I've always assumed he was grabbing a rock or something to throw at the car, but we had cleared the corner before he could throw anything. I told my dad about it when I got home, and he made me call the police to report it, and the woman at the station actually sounded pretty concerned, which I wasn't expecting. After that, I read up on all these stories about the legendary Bunny Man, and lots of them described a crazy man yelling about trespassing, which was already enough to freak me out. But what's really wild is the guy could kind of match some of the descriptions given in other reports. What made it so confusing was that he didn't look crazy or dangerous. He was maybe 5'10", white, I'd say in his mid-50s, and he looked quite fit and healthy and he was wearing a flannel, jeans, and a baseball cap. I still can't figure out where he could have walked up from, though. I'd been checking my mirrors and peripherals the whole time we were parked there, up to the moment the first girl gasped. All I can think was that he might have walked straight out of his bamboo forest that's on the right as you first come out the other side of the narrow tunnel through under the bridge. We had turned around and we were facing the bridge from the other side, so this bamboo was on our left side, and the whole rest of the immediate area is thickly forested, aside from a long, wide concrete driveway to our right just in front of us. I never heard back from the police about it. I've gone back there a few times since it happened, but I won't ever park and sit around there again. I just drive friends through the bridge who haven't seen it before and then turn around and leave. All in all, it made for a perfect campfire story, but I still wonder what he would have done if I'd stepped out or if he had gotten hold of that nightstick flashlight. The only logical explanation is that he's a resident that's sick of kids partying down there, which I get, but to say he overreacted is an understatement, not to mention he completely fed into the lore of the crazy man yelling at trespassers. This happened to me on Thursday, April 25th, and I still can't shake off how terrifying and strange it was. I was home alone getting ready for my 12 p.m. class that morning, and I opened my blinds to let some natural light in. I glanced out my window to see a man in his mid-thirties wearing a baseball cap roaming around my property with his hands on his hips, walking with a lot of weird confidence. Our yard is kind of like a cliff and it looks over onto our five acres of property down below. I live in a pretty scenic area with a really nice view. I was really confused and thought maybe it was a worker that my mom had hired for our renovations of the house that was just admiring the view. I'm a little bit uncomfortable at this point because the guy walks to the side of my house and out of sight. I head upstairs to see him now roaming around my front yard in my driveway, looking at things, checking out my house. He still hasn't seen me at this point. I called my dad and asked him if we had hired anybody recently to come by the house. And he says not that he knows of and tells me that he's going to call my mom and ask her and then call me back. I'm waiting for the call when I notice this strange guy's car. It's a white Honda with no license plates, just parked parallel to my front door. The guy still hasn't seen me and he's still wandering around. So I take this as an opportunity to remember that we have a security system, and I armed it. So if he tried to break in, it would immediately alert the police. If this was some sort of professional or worker, he would have rang my doorbell or knocked at least once. He did neither. 
Just then I get a call back from my dad saying neither him or my mom hired anybody to come by today. And then I need to call the police immediately. I went back downstairs after making sure to lock every door and window upstairs and called my city's police station. I explained to a woman on the other end of the phone what is happening and she decides that she is not going to send an officer out and instead gives me a number to call their emergency dispatch line and told me to talk to them. I call the number she gave me and immediately I get an automated message saying, Thank you for calling the non-emergency hotline. Nobody is available to take your call right now. If this is an emergency, please hang up and dial 911. At this point, I'm really irritated because 15 minutes has passed and this weird guy is still lurking around my house while I'm home alone. And apparently that wasn't enough to warrant an emergency to the lady I called at my local police station. I hung up and decided to call 911. After getting in touch with the 911 operator, I was asked a series of questions about his appearance before they would even alert officers near me to start heading towards my house. The whole thing seemed really weird. Nobody was in a hurry to have police come up to my place when I was a younger girl home alone with a strange guy outside. I asked the officer if I could stay on the line with her, when she finally, after what seemed like forever, alerted police to come to where I was. She agreed, and I went back upstairs to check on the weird guy, and he's now sitting in his unplated Honda, either listening to a radio show extremely loudly, or on a phone call with someone through his car. It was a very prominent, loud male voice coming from his car. Then all of a sudden, I hear the tone you hear when somebody hangs up on you, and the operator was no longer on the line. I was really confused when my thoughts were interrupted by an unrecognized phone number calling me. I assumed it was the operator calling me back, so I picked up. Instead, I was greeted by really creepy, heavy breathing. I'm not sure whose it was, but it really scared me. I hung up immediately and dialed back 911. I had been pretty calm up to this point, but that phone call put me in panic mode. I got on the phone with another operator who already knew my situation and address before I could even explain it to her. She said the police were on their way. Twenty minutes had passed at this point. The guy is still in his car, and the police aren't here. Keep in mind I live in a smaller town, so there is no reason why it took the police as long as it did for them to come down. Finally, this guy is leaving my driveway right as the police pull in, and they stop and ask him a few questions. A cop then comes to my door and hands me a sketchy-looking flyer, saying it was just a landscaper. He said he had an appointment. I was really relieved and irritated that it was just a guy my mom had hired, until I realized it wasn't. I called my mom back and said the police said it was just a landscaper that you hired, and he had an appointment. My mom replies with, I can assure you we never hired a landscaper. We don't even need one. So anybody with somebody outside posing to be a landscaper immediately called the police. For a little context, I moved out from my family home around 10 months ago to go to a university across the country. I have a very crazy hair color and very long hair, so I've been noted by both friends and strangers many times about it, and about how easy I am to spot from afar. Anyways, I got myself a tiny first floor apartment in a building in a very calm and family friendly area around the city. Because of this, I did not feel too unsafe about living on the first floor, considering that my bedroom had a big window with transparent curtains only about half a meter up from the ground, looking into a small grassy hill leading into a foresty area behind the building. I was quite excited about moving out for the first time, so I happily overlooked this fact and the rude landlady. Besides, this city is within the Arctic Circle, meaning that since it was summertime, there was midnight sun. Also noteworthy, it would eventually be no sun at all for about two months during winter time. The landlady told me both, and the other female student that I lived with, that the small area behind the apartment building that our windows looked into were off limits. No one would ever walk there, so it was supposedly safe to keep the curtains open at all times. In order to reach this area, 
a person has to either climb over a three meter tall wooden fence that went below the area ground, or climb this about two meters off a ground wall leading up to the foundation level and the grassy area outside my window. There's nothing in this area but a stripe of grass, and in winter time, deep masses of snow that goes all the way up to the window. A few weeks after moving in, I started feeling a little creeped out, for seemingly no reason. I would sit at my desk and read, and feel as if someone could be watching me from behind the trees, on the other side of the fence. As it started getting darker, I realized that anyone from the outside could easily watch me, as if I lived in an aquarium when the apartment was all lit up. Then one day, as stupid as it sounds, I was trying to get a good selfie light in front of the window when a man suddenly walked by. It really startled me, and I almost dropped my phone by the surprise. So I sat down for a moment and laughed to myself, thinking about how silly it must have looked with me pressed up against the window, all consumed with myself. I tried to reason with myself that it was probably just some man taking a shortcut to somewhere else. Or maybe it was the caretaker of the building. So I just drew the curtains together and left it at that. From then on, every now and then, I would suddenly see the man walking past my window. Always when the curtains were open. It would happen when I was sitting at my desk studying. Or sitting in my bed watching TV. I could see someone from the corner of my eye walk by. Slow enough for me to turn and register it to be the same fully grown kind of gray-haired man in a blue jacket. But it was never long enough for me to take notice in his facial features or anything distinctive. By walking there you could get a full view of my room and me sitting at my desk. At the time I started thinking about the landlady's claim that no one was supposed to ever be walking back there. So I asked my roommate if she had noticed anyone walking out there too. She laughed too, asking if I was even sure that I saw someone. Now these events did not happen that often, but often enough for me to really start wondering if it was not just a shortcut that this man was taking. I half jokingly texted my parents about it, telling them I was an easy victim with the aquarium window and transparent curtains. My mother naturally freaked out and decided to send me some non-see-through light blocking curtains. Before they ever arrived, I started noticing that this man did not just walk by my window once. Sometimes maybe a half a minute later he would return from the other way, and then walk by again. I have to point out once more how narrow this area is, making it so that his jacket would almost slide across my window while walking past. After the new curtains arrived, the problem seemed to be solved. I could finally sleep at night again, and thought no more of it. Lived my life unbothered until I finally went back to my hometown for Christmas. It was when I returned back that I realized something was definitely going on. I had began dating a guy and brought him home to watch movies, during which the curtains were open and it was pitch black outside. One night, where for unknown reasons I felt very restless and my insomnia was just more terrible than usual. I woke up around 5am and peeked out the window to see deep and large footprints in the snow stopping very close in front of my window. They also led across the area, but judging from the shape of the footprints, it seemed this person had walked back and forth. Now this alone is very creepy, the idea that someone had been standing there close to the window, trying to peek through the gaps of the curtains, but there was more. Yellow snow everywhere under the window yellow drops on my window seal. This psycho had pissed on my window. I was exhausted and tired, so I did not think it through right away. I just told myself it was indeed nasty and creepy, but perhaps it was just some guy stumbling home drunk after a night out and needed to relieve himself. As I woke up more though, I realized that it was very illogical for a drunk to manage to climb his way up there not to mention that he would choose a window instead of a wall. As the sun went up, I looked out the window more, 
and it just seemed way too determined that someone would just choose my window out of the row. It seemed kind of personal and angry. I was living alone at this point too, as my roommate had moved out a few months earlier. The curtains into her room were always open, and as I went to check the footprints, had just walked right past the window towards mine. While trying not to freak myself out too much, I thought about previous suitors and all that. People that might be pissed off that I was seeing someone new, but it really did not fit their character. Then I remembered that man, who had been walking outside my window in the months after I first moved in. Maybe he had been watching me this entire time, and did this to mark his territory, or something sick like that. As for recently, things did not work out with the guy I was seeing, and since then nothing more, as far as I can tell. Now that the snow is melting, it's hard to tell if somebody is out there at night, and I always keep my curtains closed. I'm still freaked out, and I wanted to color my hair back to a normal color, so I wasn't so noticeable. I can't wait to return to my hometown again for the summer, so I can finally feel safe while sleeping at night. This happened about 15 years ago. At the time I was dating around, and I had a few creepy encounters during that time, but this guy takes the cake. He was an acquaintance that my brother had met at a bar a few times, and was showing around the local area because he was new to the country. My brother set us up because he was apparently desperate for a girlfriend, and I guess I was pretty desperate too, because we went on a date together. That date was probably the worst date I've ever had. I showed up to the restaurant where we were meeting at. He was late, which isn't a huge deal, so I let it slip and we went to sit down. To be honest, I knew from the start I wasn't really attracted to him, but I thought I would be polite and see if we had a nice night. He started off polite too. He held the door for me, pulled my seat out. It wasn't really necessary, but it was nice anyways. Then, when we were sitting down waiting for someone to come and take our orders, I was reading the menu and he started talking about how much his fiancé would have liked this place. That took me by surprise, and naturally I asked him about his fiancé. He revealed that he had a fiancé before moving over here, but he had just left her to move to another country. I asked why they had broken up, and he said they never really broke up as such, but he got fed up of her nagging him about various things, so he moved away. I really didn't know what to say after that, so I changed the subject and started asking him more about himself and where he used to live. He wasn't really very forthcoming. Eventually, our waiter came and started talking to us. To clarify for the next part, our waiter was a man of color, and he had an unusual accent for our area. So my date stares blankly at him for a while, then turns to me and says, You understand this guy? I said that, yes, I could understand him, before telling him our orders. After he left, my lovely date continued to shock me. He said, I wouldn't normally leave ordering to the lady, but that brown guy talked really weird and I didn't get it. Wow, way to tell me that you're a racist and a sexist in one breath. Again, I was speechless for a few moments before I got angry with him. I don't remember exactly what I said. It was something along the lines of, Well, I'm not a lady, so I can order for myself just fine, thanks. And why make racial remarks? Then he got annoyed with me and told me that he wasn't being racist. He just wasn't used to that kind of person where he was from. I pointed out that he wouldn't have met me if he just stuck to people he was used to in his own country. He did calm down then and told me that he wouldn't want that because he's glad he met me. Honestly, I found that a little weird given that I didn't see any way to say that this date wasn't going well and he didn't know me very well at all. But I decided since we had ordered I should stay and get my meal and try to redeem the evening before I leave and never see this man again. So I answered some of his questions about me. Basic getting to know me questions and small talk stuff for the most part. Then started on about my previous dates. If I was a virgin, whether I would be willing to wait until marriage and then be submissive to my husband or not. It was at this point I realized that I was most likely on a date with a religious bigot, hence the misogyny weird attitude to sexual stuff, 
and all his other closed-minded bullcrap. So I settled for a none of your business. Now I need to leave. I checked the prices on the menu and left money for my half of the food, plus a tip, on the table and got up to leave. He said he didn't see why I was being unreasonable with him, as though this had been a normal date, but then told me that I couldn't expect him to take my money, because that was an insult to him. Fine. You want to pay for a meal that's not getting eaten? You pay for it. I'm not that mad about spending my money. That'll stop you. So I took my money back and walked straight out. I just assumed that yes, it was an awful evening, but I wouldn't have to see him again at least. I wasn't even back to my house when my brother started texting me, asking where I was because my date had called him in tears, saying I had gone off for no reason and he didn't know where I was or what to do. Thankfully my brother was pretty calm about it and assumed that I had left for a reason. I explained everything to him and he was pretty surprised too. After that night we both tried to cut contact. My brother stopped meeting up with the guy, and we both blocked the Facebook account we had for him too. My brother also blocked his number because he would not stop texting him asking about me, alternating between being really worried about me to saying he hoped I'd drop dead. Then he started making endless different accounts on social media to harass us. He told my brother he didn't know why we weren't talking to him. He posted a bunch of weird posts describing me in detail before going on to call me a lot of horrible names. We kept blocking them and moving on. Then the harassment got worse. He either found me and followed me at some point or got my address from a friend and turned up one day, standing around outside my house, asking him to come in and speak to me. When I refused to let him in, he grabbed my arm to prevent me from going in either and started to tell me that he didn't want me to go in because I would never find a man who loved me like he did and that if I walked away from him again, I would regret it one day, when I was old and lonely. He went on and on like this for ages, and ages, while I tried to pull my arm away from him, before I got fed up of this and yelled at him to get off of me and leave me alone, and then I kicked him in the shin. He let go of my arm but cursed at me and said I was being ungrateful to him, but I took my opportunity to run inside and lock my door. He started banging on my door, then trying to push it inwards. I was getting both upset by this man and just super fed up of his presence in my life. So I grabbed my phone and called the police, telling them that someone was trying to get into my house. I was told someone would be there with me soon, but 20 to 30 minutes later there was no sign of them anywhere. And I was getting quite upset because this man was forcing my door, and I thought the lock was going to break soon, so I called my brother, who lives nearby, just because I knew he would come even though I wasn't sure he'd be much help. About 15 minutes later, my brother turns up, and after a brief conversation, I didn't quite hear outside. The pressure was gone off the door. I waited a few minutes and then texted my brother to see what was going on, and if it would be alright to look outside now. He didn't reply, and the next thing I heard was the police turning up. I went out to see what was going on. Apparently, after my initial call, they had received another call from a neighbor saying that there were two men fighting on my lawn. I guess this was my brother and the guy, since my brother looked out of breath and pretty shook up, and the guy wasn't around anymore. My brother explained to the police that he had tried to stop the man from getting into my house, and then the man had hit him. I told my side of the story, and some of my other neighbors were asked what they had seen, and were able to tell them about his attempts to get in. Plus, there were marks on the outside of my door where he had been trying to repeatedly get in. The police went to look for him, and a few weeks after I called and told them, and they told me they thought they had found him, but when they wanted me to look at the suspect person, it wasn't the same man. I didn't hear anything else, and I don't know whatever happened to him. I didn't see him again, so I'm probably safe after 15 years. But regardless, I don't ever want to see him again. A few days ago, I'm walking downtown in the mid-afternoon, when I become aware of a presence walking behind me. It's a busy city and a crowded street, so I don't think much of it. But this man stands right behind me for a few blocks. I can hear his breathing behind me, becoming ragged and coarse. 
He's breathing heavily, and it gets heavier as he follows me. I don't want to turn around or make eye contact, but I can sense him following me. Then, I hear him say it. Honey, if you don't slow down, I'll never catch up to you. I get terrified. I feel my blood run cold, and I whip around to confront him. He's big, at least a foot taller than me, and I can see on his chest one of those sticky paper ID tags. It's from a mental hospital. A mental patient has been following me for blocks, and now is trying to get me to slow down. I turn away and immediately cross the street, not looking back, but he appeared to stop following me at that point. I'm just still terrified by the incident. That's how the story would be told if I were the woman, but I'm not. I'm the guy. And this is the story about how I accidentally became somebody else's let's not meet story. I have been out of the office for over a week due to a nasty bronchitis virus that utterly wiped me out. And my girlfriend, my poor loving girlfriend, who nursed me back to health, has now been stuck at home sick. And this was my first day back at work. I feel bad for her. I decided to try and do something nice for her. She's an avid player of an Elder Scrolls Online, you see, which just released a new expansion. And that expansion allowed for a new class. And she had put off getting the expansion in order to focus on picking up the slack for my illness. So I decide I'm going to go get it for her. I decide on my lunch break to go to the nearest GameStop and get her the digital code. So on my lunch I head out. Now here's the thing. The local GameStop and my office are on opposite sides of a very large hill. Remember also, I've been sick all week with bronchitis. Now I get to the GameStop, buy the digital code, and text her a picture of it along with a message very jokingly tell her that she needs to wait till I get home to play it because I'll never catch up otherwise. Then I start heading back to the office, and I start walking back up the hill. And this is where the heat and the humidity and the fact that I'm walking uphill after, once again, having bronchitis starts to take its toll. And I begin to, I'm quite sure very audibly, breathe heavily. I also just so happen to be walking the exact same path of a woman who has ended up walking right in front of me. And I've now been walking behind for a couple of blocks. Two important things about me. First... I'm a tech nerd, so I have the smartwatch, the Bluetooth earbud, the whole nine yards. Second, I'm a big guy, and the six foot two, 240 pounds college athlete who still works out a lot and could probably beat you up sort of way. I'm a scary looking guy. I'm a gosh dang teddy bear who posts pictures of his cat on Reddit and wouldn't hurt a soul, but I am fully aware that in the wrong context, let's say you're a five foot woman and you think I'm following you could be freaking terrifying. So what's the tech nerd relevance here? Smartwatch, Bluetooth. My girlfriend calls me and I tap on my watch to pick up the call without taking the phone out of my pocket, which syncs directly to my Bluetooth earbuds. My girlfriend hears that audible chime on her end and knowing I've picked up launches into how she couldn't wait and is already playing without me. And that's when I quite jokingly, as I'm glad she's filling up to it, tell her, Honey, if you don't slow down, I'll never catch up. And the woman ahead of me freaks out and whips around. And I immediately realize, oh my god, she thinks I'm talking to her because I'm not holding a phone and I've been following her for the last two blocks, audibly wheezing. And then I realize something else. Remember how I said that it was my first day back to work? I still wasn't 100% and I had left my work ID at home. And I work in a very secure government building, the kind of building that doesn't just let you into it. Even if all the security guards know your face, because you've been there for 10 years now. No ID, you still gotta go, get a near cavity search level screen in. And wait for your HR to verify that yes, you still work there, and no, you're not a disgruntled ex-employee looking to steal confidential files. But once you've got your morning colonoscopy, they do give you one of those odd visitor badges 
so you can come and go in the building throughout the day without having to have your pride and personal boundaries violated every time. And this little sticky badge that I still had stuck to my chest bears the name of the government agency which I work for. What agency is that? The Department of Mental Health. Because I, despite looking like someone who may have some point in his life had a nickname like Moose, which has on occasion I think led some to initially get the impression that I might be a tad slow on the uptake, am legally the regional legal director and deputy chief counsel for the state office and health of human services. Her eyes move to the badge. She stays motionless for a moment, then turns and quickly hustles down a side street. It was at that moment I say to my girlfriend, I think some lady just thought I was trying to kidnap her. So here's to you, downtown lady, who I'm pretty sure thought I was some heavy-breathing pervert mental patient instead of a government bureaucrat who was just trying to do something nice for his girlfriend on his lunch break.